the whole of nutrition advice had been so muddled and, and confused, it's not about you know that one thing that you do or you don't do. It's right. about the holistic view. Mm -hmm. What can you get on your plate? If three quarters of it's filled with a giant steak, there's not much room for your plants. Food is medicine. We are now at the threshold. Do prescribed foods to sidestep disease, predict diagnostic outcomes, and enhance well being on a highly individuated basis? And at the pointy tip of this revolution is today's guest, Dr. Tim Spector. Professor Tim Spector. Professor Spector. Medical professor Tim Spector. Many consider you to be the leading expert on gut health and diet. Tim is a globally renowned epidemiologist, geneticist, and author. Right. Micro of these microscopic organisms that builds this community in your gut, only recently we've discovered are like mini pharmacies. Awarded the distinction of Order of the British Empire, Tim is also the best-selling author of several books, including The Diet Myth, and his latest, Food for Life, is an in-depth scientific breakdown on what to eat, when, and why to improve our own personal nutrition. In this episode, we expand upon my many past conversations about the microbiome. We talk about the importance of plant diversity in one's diet. We talk about the environmental implications of food systems and consumer food choices, the future of food, microbiome science, and plenty more. Before we dive in, this episode is brought to you today by Roca. Now, I get asked fairly consistently about the very stylish spectacles you always see me wearing on the show. Well, the answer is Roca. I love them. Everything Roca makes is designed for high performance. All their glasses and sunglasses are super light with premium optics. These are the Hamilton frames, but Roca has tons of great styles, none of which will ever slip off your face, no matter how much you sweat. I'll be sharing a bit more about Roca later, but right now let's get into it with Dr. Tim Spector. This one is appointment listening. Enjoy. Well, Tim, it's a delight to have you here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, as I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, I've had the privilege and the pleasure of hosting many conversations about the microbiome, about gut health over the years, including the good Dr. B, Will Bolsowitz, friend of the podcast, who's sitting right over there right now, who accompanied you. Um, but today is a particular honor uh, because as Dr. B insisted I make clear, uh, you truly are the uh, world's leading authority in this field at the cutting edge of all this fascinating emerging science uh, that's creating a new way of learning about how our bodies work, how they operate um, in the world and it's very exciting. So not only are you somebody who's innovating new research, uh, you are also pioneering this, this fascinating field that I wanna learn more about that we're calling citizen science, which we're gonna get into. But I think the best place to begin is just to understand what got you interested in this field, kind of the origin story behind this and kind of defining our terms uh, with respect to you know what we're talking about when we're talking about gut health and the microbiome. Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to be mm. here. Big fan of the podcast, um, so very excited. And my journey has been a bit of a long one, so I- We got time. Plenty of time, okay, so, um, because I'm old, so that that's what makes, makes one's career longer. Um, I started life as a, a, a doctor, went to medical school and got interested in epidemiology, which is a study of populations, mm -hmm. uh, but there was no real jobs in that. So I trained as a rheumatologist, uh, studying bones and joints and uh, made my way up training in that in, in London, in, in medical schools. and. On the way, I did a master's in epidemiology. I was still interested in that side of why diseases happen in populations, this sort of detective in me that wanted to find out why things happen. And I, when I did my um, three years uh, research and my thesis in, in that whole area, and it was only really after, in about uh, 30 years ago that I, um, I changed tack from purely rheumatology and I started what's called the, the Twins UK project, which mm -hmm. was setting up uh, this twin volunteer system across the UK, which now has 15,000 twins in it and has been running out for 30 years. So that was 
the largest of its kind in the world, where we were intensively looking at these twins as they were getting older and looking at a whole range of disease. And obviously started with bones and joints, which at the time no one knew you know, much about. And the whole idea of the twin study was this nature v nurture debate. And it was really a really cool time to be doing that because many of the diseases we thought were purely due to aging, for example, uh, ended up having a big genetic component. And many things that we thought were genetic ended up not being particularly mm. genetic. So we found that you know, back pain was three times more genetic than breast cancer. Interesting, and also to interject here, uh, you know, the, the state of science with respect to what we understood about genetics in 1992 is very different than it is today. Yeah, it's hard to believe how much our opinions have changed and how, you know, the scientists and, and doctors of the time have had these fixed views about everything was degenerative. It was just, everything was wear and tear mm -hmm. and your body just wore out. And that was a common thing for anything to do with aging. And the idea that there were these big differences between people really wasn't really considered. So it, it was really quite exciting to be able to write these pivotal papers to disprove a lot of you know, clinical nonsense that had been talked about and, and why some diseases were given more priority than others because they were more exciting, they were sexy diseases, others were sort of dull, aging diseases. Mm -hmm. So that was the time we were living. And it was also just as the sort of genetic revolution was starting, so we were starting at gene markers, et cetera. But um, it, it took the first 10 years was really convincing people that there was a genetic component to common diseases. At that, up to that point, really only been the rare ones that people had focused on or the sort of exciting ones. So that was a cool time. And I, and I came out of my little field of, you know, osteoporosis and arthritis and back pain into all the other common chronic disease of aging. And that uh, led us to publish all kinds of fascinating work and made me realize that I, if you had a model that worked, you might as well study all the interesting stuff you can, not be stuck mm -hmm. in a in a specialty like most of my colleagues mm -hmm. remain. So from what I understand, I mean, obviously when you're studying twins, it's fascinating to see a difference in outcomes between two different people that share uh, the same genetic makeup and then trying to figure out like why those, what's driving those, the, that differential, right? Um, what aspect of their nurturing it, or their environment is, you know, compelling one to you know become ill and the other one to remain healthy. Um, but was there some sort of epiphany along the way that triggered this fascination that led you into the microbiome, or you know how did that kind of evolve out of you know studying these pairs over so many years? Well, I think I eventually got out of my system that everything was genetic. So mm -hmm. um, I was telling everyone everything is genetic. It turns out that fifty percent is the of ever you name any disease, 50% roughly is genetic. And that got a bit dull because I... And it's so not got, a very satisfying no, answer. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. And it, it was useful because we you know, then went on to find genes. But as it turned out, they weren't that useful either, other than maybe for long-term drug targets and things. But for me, I started looking more closely at why identical twins who were basic genetic clones and lived the first 18 years of their life completely together, ended up often dying of different diseases. So the aging process was different. There was no real genetic base of longevity. It was very small. One would die of cancer, the other one wouldn't. Uh, one would get autoimmune disease, the other one wouldn't. One would be depressed, one wouldn't. So I was suddenly intrigued why we were seeing this when you know all the previous stuff was showing it was quite seem to be genetic and yet the identical twins, which is this perfect model of these, it's like, you know, all of us have this shadow person that can be doing, in a, living in a different environment to us, uh, what happens to them? It's like your own little controlled right. study. And so I was fascinated by this and I was, I was then determined to try and look and see what were those factors? Was it gene mutations that were different between them? Turned out that wasn't the case. I looked at something called epigenetics, 
which is where you can switch genes on and off with chemical mm. signals. Did that for a few years. Only small differences that couldn't really explain these mm. big effects. And it was then, it was about, um, yeah, 2000, about just over, you know, 11 years ago that I came across the microbiome and said, let's test this in twins. And that was really epiphany because I found that identical twins had very different microbes. And it was the first time I'd, in, you know, 20 odd years of studying them, that I'd found something really different in identical twins. And suddenly I said, wow, that's, that's kind of, that is really cool because why should they be different? And yet, if they are different, that could explain why we, we all get different diseases slightly what we thought was randomly mm. because of this whole new organ in our bodies that is behaving very differently in all of us and essentially producing lots of different chemicals. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a, an aha moment both for realizing, you know, this, what we thought was this randomness of disease, but importantly also changed um, my perception about f how food works as well and why, the, why, in a way, the whole of nutrition advice had been so muddled and, and confused and seemingly with poor science because we'd assumed everyone behaves the same. Once that food goes into you, you know, it's going to behave the same way in everybody. And right. suddenly knowing that even in identical twins, they only share maybe a quarter of their microbes means that in response to the same food, they're all going to respond very differently. So that was the theoretical moment when I said, aha, this could be really interesting. I'm going to spend, you know, the next at least decade working on this rather than all these other areas which I could work on to try and get to the bottom of it because I think it could be much bigger than just looking at a few microbes. Right, so it is quite a watershed moment or a paradigm shift to realize or, or, or to kind of reflect upon this conventional perspective, which is our genetic makeup is what differentiates us and it becomes this predictor of a variety of things. But in reality, the genetic differences, like we're much more genetically similar than we are different, right? And that's a very, you know, set number of variables. It's still incredibly complex, but it feels very simplistic in comparison to the diversity of the microbiome and understanding that maybe a better way to look at it is through the differences in, in you know, these trillions of microbes that are dramatically different from one individual to the next, irrespective of similarities in their genetic makeup, like, and using that as a lens and then trying to, to sort of wend that or tie that to certain outcomes as a predictor seems like an impossible not to untie because of the infinite number of variables involved. Yeah, it's, it's sort of mind boggling the complexity of it, but I think it's, it's becoming clear that yes, there are lots of different strains and microbes and you know, trillions of them, but the thing that do, does bind them in common is they are essentially mini pharmacies they are taking a food as their sort of consumables and pumping out all kinds of chemicals that are unique to us and our, and our, and our system mm -hmm. and in completely in different amounts. And so there is a certain amount of redundancy in these microbes, but the difference, and I think that the key difference is not so much the microbe, but their, the products they make, the chemicals. And that's, that's the essential, uh, for me, the big difference is understanding food and nutrition, not as macronutrients or these rather old fashioned ways of looking at it, but in, 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 a, in chemicals mm -hmm. that we are converting one set of chemicals as food by our microbes into these other chemicals, which have massive effects on our immune system, our brains and our, our bodies and our health. And I think as complex as the microbiome is, it can be simplified by understanding those, those chemicals and this whole science of metabolomics, which is the study of studying these metabolites. Mm. So I don't think it's an impossible uh, scenario at all. And luckily because of the genetic revolution, 
we have the tools now to measure our microbiome incredibly accurately and actually uncover you know, 75, 80% of the, of the microbes that are in there, which is pretty, you know, we wow. wouldn't have believed that possible. Yeah, 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 that's unbelievable. 10 years ago, and the cost has come down from $5,000 a sample you know, to less than $100 a mm-hmm. sample in, in, you know, in 10 years. So it's, it's been an incredible journey and, you know, we're just really scraping the surface of what we know about these things, but they have huge potential um, in all kinds of areas, not just in nutrition, but in you know, sure. pharmacy and uh, fighting disease and, and everything else because of this, all these incredible chemicals they're producing all the time that we co-evolved with. So before we even go any further, it would probably be good to just define what you mean when you say the microbiome, like what are we talking about specifically? In general terms, the microbiome is the term we use for the community of microbes, microorganisms that live in our bodies. And we generally refer to the 99% that live in our lower intestine, our colon. And the microbiome really refers to the genes of those microbes, um, should technically be called the microbiota, mm-hmm. but we just use the most microbiome because I'm not fussy about words and um, everyone now understands that. So these, there are, some dispute about how many there are, but they're probably, a, there are certainly trillions, maybe a hundred trillion or so, roughly the same numbers of cells in our body. Most of them are, the ones we know about are bacteria, but there are also these other uh, related species called archaea, and there are fungi and uh, yeasts, and there are viruses, five times as many viruses as bacteria that feed off them called phages, which also have a role in health. And there are even parasites that virtually all of us have to some extent in our guts and some of which turn out to be beneficial as well. So it's this whole community, a bit like an ecosystem that is living within us and it best considers a virtual organ. Stick them all together, they weigh about two kilograms, same as your brain. And they're basically, as I said, these mini pharmacies pumping out chemicals which send signals all over a body, but particularly to all the immune cells, the majority of which are immune cells are actually lining our gut. And so they interact with those immune cells on a constant basis, signaling whether to uh, be aggressive or be passive and modifying them, tuning them up and down. That helps fight aging, helps fight cancer, sorts out allergies, um, et cetera, et cetera, fights infections. And they also produce lots of chemicals that might go to our brain um, responsible for serotonins and um, many other pathways in the, in the brain as well. So it affects our mood and obviously our metabolism and how we digest food mm-hmm. amongst others. And right, like so many infinite, things, infinite right? things. But this idea that, that our immune system really resides in our gut is kind of a shocking revelation. Like I always understood that our immune system originates in our bone marrow and you know this yeah. is where we're producing That's you know, what all I was these cells and school. yeah this is why yeah this is <laughs> and 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 why is it that we didn't begin to really even put these pieces together in a methodical way until I don't know the early 2000s like it seems like you kind of got into this around 2011 right like mm-hmm. this is all extremely recent because prior to that conventional wisdom was sort of like you know, para- we got to get rid of parasites and all this stuff. This is these 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 are plaguing the human body. And at some point, somebody figured out like actually we're living symbiotically with all of this, and this is crucial to every facet of health. And we're still, it feels like, in the very early beginning stages of trying to understand the true and vast implications of this incredibly complex system. I think it was medical hubris that says that you know, our powerful drugs can get rid of this stuff. We're fighting Mm -hmm. the West of the world. We know that microbes have killed lots of people in history, infectious diseases, you know, were vitally important. We survived them. Therefore, you know, we can beat them and antibiotics, sterilizing creams, um, you know, keeping people away from dirt. uh, This is the way we're gonna conquer our sort of, Mm -hmm. uh, our fears and I think, it was a blind spot to realize that the gut health really was important. And you know, for so long, just regarded that 
the intestine is a tube to get rid of toxins. Right. And that's its own Absorb purpose. nutrients. Some, and, some people still yeah. believe that, right? But you uh -huh. know, uh, particularly the toxin bit, but the um, not realizing it had such major implications as a vital organ for us. And I think it was, you know, few people guessed at it. And even the, the you know, you go back to the days of a hundred years ago, Metchinkoff and uh, Pasteur talking about yogurt. They thought it worked because it deputrified the body, you know, mm. got rid of these toxins. They couldn't still imagine that it was feeding other, other microbes inside there. So it, I think we just had a blind spot to it. Some people believe the Indi Indian, ancient Indian art, you know, understood the, what, the sort of core of the gut to health. And so ancient Chinese and ancient Indian did know, but of course they couldn't see these microorganisms, uh, couldn't grow them. And uh, this has been part of the problem. You know, we, right. Medical science just couldn't see them until genetics came along. Mm. And so over the course of the 30 years under which the Twins UK research has been ongoing, there's been like a thousand research papers that have come out of this. What are some of the, the revelations that um, have emanated out of looking at twins through this lens? Oh, it's hard to pick highlights. I mean, because there were some revelations at the time, they seem might seem rather dull now. Mm. Like I was saying, you know, back pain is highly genetic. Uh, might not surprise people now to say, you know, but um, um, other ones were we, one of the first to look at uh, fat distribution was highly genetic. So whether when you put on weight, whether you accumulate it in your belly or your or your your bum, mm -hmm. uh, really strongly genetic. And you can see that in families, it's sort of obvious. Um, we showed for the first time that cataract wasn't just, a, was something you, you inherited as well. Um, we looked at um, early risk factors for melanoma, found that, because um, everyone talks about melanoma, they're always talking about sunshine, which is a really overrated risk factor for melanoma. It's actually highly heritable about whether you have these lots of moles. Mm -hmm. You have light skin and lots of moles, much stronger uh, genetics uh, than anything else. And so you can divide people into those groups. And twin studies helped us with that. And uh, we did a, uh, sort of fun stuff. We found sense of humor wasn't particularly genetic. Um, political views were. <laughs> so your right wing views or um, your uh, left wing views have a quite a strong heritable basis. Interesting. As does belief in God have a heritable basis. So there's nearly anything that you can quantify, you can um, study in this way if it's if you can quantify it reliably and get the similar answer. So it 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 allowed us to look at um, sexuality as well, and uh, we were the first to look at the genetics of female sexuality. And uh, so you can study any personality or trait um, in that way, as well as things like the microbiome, um, epigenetics, which, you know, again, has some genetic influences and even things like vitamins. So people are always talking about, oh, my vitamin D level is low. Well, we were the first to show how that was strongly heritable and that there are certain mm. genes. So. 50% of the differences between, say, our vitamin D levels are gonna be due to differences in our genes. So what's normal for you isn't gonna be normal for me. And how does epigenetics play into that? From my understanding, epigenetics basically um, means uh, the potential for genetic expression. And also this idea that, um, that we're, we're kind of storing genetic information passed on from our ancestors that is perhaps latent, but given the right set of circumstances could be expressed. Like how, you know, that, that seems like a sticky wicket and very complicated to kind of understand. And there's a, there's a certain aspect of it that's, that's sort of mystical in terms of like um, the inheritance of, of like ancestral trauma and things like that. Like how does that play into how you think about this and, 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 and study populations? Well, I wrote a book about this called Identically Different, which nobody read, but it was, mm. I think it was a great book, but uh, you know, as often the way. And, went into a bit of this and a bit theorizing about it. And it's, it's been called soft inheritance. 
So it's an inheritance. We think, think it's an evolutionary adaptation that allows in times of stress or famine or some emotional stress to just um, switch the genes on or off in a way that uh, takes you on a different path mm -hmm. and to some extent. And the general belief is that it takes so long to change your genes normally that you know, your whole family would have been wiped out by that time you'd made that switch. But if this allows you to, I don't know, there's a temperature change, so allows you to switch so you gain more weight or um, just the fact that your family might all be switching their genes so that they end up more different. So they're not all gonna be wiped out by the same um, environmental stress mm -hmm. or infective mm -hmm. agent. Uh, makes some sort of sense. So, but it just lasts for a couple of generations and then fizzles out. So it, when I was looking at it, I did interview lots of identical twins who went through stress, for example. And uh, it was quite remarkable that say, you know, a very major family breakup or something when the teenage twins, one, for example, would uh, responded by overeating and got very obese and the other one had an eating disorder and ended up with anorexia. Mm. So they were acting in response to a stress, but very differently, probably because the, in theory, you know, the, the genes were, were switched and doing something, but there was something in our, there's something in our evolution that allows us to have these switches mm -hmm. and uh, make you depressed or happy and these things. So I think in response to stress, it does make some sense. Um, and there are lots of stories about um, after the war, Dutch hunger famines, um, whole populations having these stresses, which uh, for several generations had effect on their mental health or others right. due to these change in genes. So it's a lovely, it's a nice theory, but it, it's been really hard to prove it in humans. Mice it sort of works quite well as often the case. Uh -huh. um, and you can change mouse hair color, for example, just by giving them different vitamins and things, switching them epigenetically or giving them alcohol or whatever. Can't do that in humans, so. It's gotta be so frustrating to see, you know, amazing kind of dramatic results in my studies and not be able to replicate that in humans. I mean, that seems to be kind of like the <laughs> recurring theme well, across all areas of science. Millions of yeah. scientists <laughs> uh, have, have, yeah. have been frustrated. You know, and that's, yeah. and they say, that's why I didn't get that Nobel prize. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's so uh, the oh, humans just don't behave mm -hmm. like mice. It's very annoying. Right, and the mice studies are what, you know, generate a lot of hyperbolic headlines in terms of oh, breakthroughs. They still and do. It's a lot of consumer yeah. confusion, and and they still do, and and, yeah. and and it's similar in the microbiome. It's not not right. very. It's right. not different, and there were, you know, some misleading studies in the early days of the microbiome that just, um, you know, exaggerated the potential effects in in humans. So they were, you know, I think they were accurate, but they just, you, from mouse studies, you can't really get an idea of the scale of the effect in humans. Mm -hmm. You don't know it's trivial or it's really large. And I think that's the other sort of problem about extrapolating. And, uh, you know, we're not, we're not rodents and um, we have very different lives and we eat different things. And uh, so, uh, yeah, more and more, uh, you know, we realize that a lot of these mouse studies were flawed. And of course you can do unlimited number of mouse studies. You know, you, you've got labs, well-funded labs, they can afford to mm -hmm. slaughter thousands of mice and they don't necessarily report every experiment they do. Right. And uh, that's the other problem, mm -hmm. which human trials, they take so long to do. You, you know, whether it failed or not, you're gonna write it up because it's, yeah. uh, it's important. Yeah. We're brought to you today by Roka. Glasses are not something you normally think about as a piece of performance gear, which when you think about it is kind of insane because you can't perform at your best if you can't see. Well, the geniuses at Roka basically rebuilt eyewear from the ground up. No matter how active you are or how much you sweat, these things never slip or fall off your face. They're super durable, they look awesome, and they've got tons of super classy modern styles to choose from. I've been rocking Roka's for about four years at this point. I love them. I'm a big fan of the Hamilton style in gloss black. That's this frame right here, as well as clear, or I guess they call them vintage on the website. 
And uh, if you want to try them out for yourself, you can do that right now and unlock 20% off your order with the code RICHROLL at roca.com. Or you can click the link in the description below. Okay, back to the show. So you're starting to develop this, this you know, growing sense that the microbiome is 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 playing a much more crucial crucial role than than previously imagined, and and you know this sort of leads you into the American Gut Project and the British Gut Project. So talk a little bit about like how that came together and and what that was all about, and kind of what you discovered as a result of that. Well, so when back in 2011, there was no one really doing microbiome research in the UK, and most of it was going on in the US. So um, I got in touch with a, a colleague who I met at a meeting, Ruth Lay in Cornell, and uh, we, we uh, did all the microbiome testing in, in her lab there. And she was linked with this group that had all worked with this, really the, the father of the microbiome, Jeff Gordon, mm. and um, who based in St. Louis. And Rob Knight was another one of uh, his protégés and uh, he learned that I was really interested in this. I, I was doing the, the big twin study and uh, told me about his project, which he just started, the American Gut Project, which was a citizen science project, uh, getting Americans to sign up, basically donate money in order to pay for their own microbiome testing. Mm -hmm. And I said, I was really keen on doing this in the UK. And I think we could, you know, uh, the British public were up for this as well. And so, we got together and um, under the banner of the American Gut Project and did this and led to a, a paper where the UK I think provided about a third of the, the subject. So relatively it was more popular in the UK given mm -hmm. the, the population density. And uh, But together we uh, did a, a great paper um, which outlined how many this. Were in the, how many were in the study? There were about um, 11,000 I think it was in the end. Mm. Um, which doesn't sound much at the moment, but it was, it was the, the biggest study done to date, clearly showed a link between uh, nutritional eating habits, fiber um, and health, and showed that these, these clusters that, you know, measures of gut health, which is then we used something called diversity, um, the more diverse the species, the healthier you were and the less likely you were to be obese or have uh, diabetes. Mm -hmm. And so this was common to the, the British and the American populations. American populations tend to still be, they were slightly heavier, slightly less diverse microbes compared to the British. But the key bit of that paper was it, 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 it was the one that found that 30 plants a week uh, was the sweet spot for maximum diversity. Mm -hmm. And that's, that study still hasn't sort of been bettered um, many years later. And, it, and it's, it's been a bit of a mantra for me in the books that I write for the public about trying to educate people about what to eat. Mm -hmm. And I think what was really important about the study is that it showed as long as you ate 30 types of plant, and that's including nuts and seeds and... Um, to some extent, herb mixes and spices. It didn't matter whether you had a little bit of meat, a little bit of fish, uh, you were vegan, vegetarian, whatever, your, your gut health uh, was still optimal. And I think that still resonates with me that uh, it's not about you know, that one thing that you do or you don't do, it's right. about the holistic view mm -hmm. of that. What can you get on your plate? And clearly, if you've got a big, you know, if, if, if three quarters of it's filled with a giant steak, there's not much room for your plants. Right, so, so the, the top what, level rule just being diversity of plant life in your diet on a, the most consistent basis possible is producing the diversity in that gut microbiome ecology that is going to be you know, the sort of front lines of keeping you healthy. Yeah, and it's, mm -hmm. it, it's a, a nice simple rule that means you don't have to be too strict about right. anything else because if that's your number one rule, then everything, you know, follow. Yes, it's nice to have, you know, the rich, the colorful, polyphenol rich foods. Mm -hmm. It's nice, to, you know, the fermented foods uh, we know are good as well. 
avoiding ultra processed foods, uh, etc. But that to me is still number one, and I think that's been a a, a good, you know, a really good way of communicating it also to the public mm -hmm. about understanding so why that you want to feed your gut, why feed your gut microbes. You do it by eating right, and if mm -hmm. you do that, you know, you can't really have ultra processed food. It's very hard to get. You're crowding plants. it out. Yeah, yeah, you're crowding it out. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's an easy rule to follow. It's flexible. It's doable. Um, it's easy to wrap your head around what that means, um, and it's withstood the test of time because that project was like 2014, right? Mm -hmm. When you were doing that. Um, so I'm curious about how that was received at the time. Like we're all talking about the microbiome now. Was that the case back then? How were your colleagues sort of, you know, receiving this pivot in your career and this focus on this new science at a time where this was just emerging? Well, it didn't have any of the public impact that it, w it has now. Mm -hmm. So the newspaper. But they were like, you're a nutter, like you've gone off the reservation. Well, I mean, there was, there was awareness in 2014, people, people it wasn't like, you know, pe people were talking about the microbiome. There was an interest then, not like was, now. But. Um, but a lot of people thought it was a passing fad uh -huh. that like a lot of these new science, you know, as soon as something comes up, a lot of grants follow it, money goes there. It's hyped up because you write a grant to hype it mm -hmm. up, that's how you get your money. Uh, and then it all comes crashing down again. And a lot of people thought that the microbiome was, you know, just a few years, flash in the pan, a few fancy mouse studies, you know, there's um, a few anecdotes of fecal transplants that were successful and it would all fall over. And most of my colleagues in the UK were, were not keen on it at all. And so the countries varied about whether they supported it or not. And the UK certainly didn't. And um, that's because a few powerful people in science just said, this isn't gonna work. Mm. It's rubbish. We've got to stick with genetics. It's the only way. And also the nutrition, uh, the nutrition uh, sort of profession didn't embrace it at all either. They felt threatened by it and didn't approach it. So uh, pretty much on my own doing this, often with US collaborators or uh, overseas collaborators and getting maybe commercial money and um, we used the citizen science funding actually to get a lot of our work done, where we asked the public to, to actually pay for their, our research. Mm. And that, that really got it going. So that was, that was really where we, are, we were, um, you know, up until uh, the time when uh, I realized I wanted to do the next stage. And I was giving a talk about the microbiome and uh, that's when I met uh, these two guys, came up to me and said, we'd like to form a company. And um, with all the trouble I'd been getting, getting money academically, mm -hmm. um, I said, aha, this could be my, my big chance. But, uh, you know, I'm warning you guys, you know, the science is very expensive and no, there's no quick results, you know, the way I want to do it. I don't want to do a marketing led project. Um, with you know smiling MDs and a, and a stethoscope on the, on the front right. page, it's it, you know it, it's got to be serious science. It's going to cost you several million before we get going. So I thought I'd never see them again, but they came back a few weeks later with the money, and so uh, that's where the company Zoe was born. Right, and the the kind of operating principle behind that and the studies that you wanted to pursue were what specifically at that time? Well, we wanted to really test the idea that you could use the microbiome and other uh, blood tests to personalize uh, food choices and nutrition. That there was sufficient variability between people uh, that um, you could use that to predict everyone's response. Mm -hmm. And so give people a real idea of what they should be eating. And um, came out of this idea that, um, you know, there isn't one single diet that suits everybody. And all these studies like that of Christopher Gardner, the, the, the diet fit study where, you know, they competed high fat versus um, high carb diets and both did well, no winners or losers, but mm -hmm. within, the, within the groups, massive differences. Mm -hmm. So 
And at the same time, uh, an Israeli group had come out with, with a study showing that CGMs, uh, continuous glucose monitors, um, were able to also predict responses to food. So suddenly the idea was they had to combine the microbiome with these, uh, these, these new devices on the market to suddenly have a quantitative way of really telling people how they respond to these foods. And, but the only way to do that wasn't in theory, was to actually do a really big experiment to prove it and see if it worked. So it was a big gamble at the time. Right. Um, but luckily managed to convince uh, these guys it needed to be done. And the study was a thousand people, giving a thousand people, mainly twins, because I still believe there was yeah. a genetic component then, um, who were um, studied uh, at my hospital, St. Thomas's, and, and a group were also studied at, in um, uh, Mass General, given identical foods at the same time, and then all their bloods studied you know, and work up for 24 hours and then for two weeks onwards. And it was that experiment, which was the largest of its kind, that really was the basis for everything else we've done since then. And that was the PREDICT study. Right. And that, you know, that, as well, that gave us the next revelations, if you like. So having known that the microbiome was different between people, um, there were two other big aha moments there that when we first looked at the data. One was, when you give people an identical muffin, there was at least a tenfold difference between normal people's response in sugar and insulin to that muffin at identical time of day in laboratory conditions. So that was, well, pretty amazing. Uh, there was also a tenfold difference in their triglycerides, their blood fat levels, six hours after that meal. So everyone clears fat at a very different rate. And up to that point, no one had ever thought to even look because mm -hmm. we only take fasting levels mm -hmm. which aren't mm -hmm. very informative and that really meant that we had the basis of a big enough variation to build algorithms to predict how people would do based on those sort of baseline standard tests right so so it, it provides this like sort of starting base to try to begin to understand the nature of personalized nutrition and lifestyle habits and the variations you know between people and how those you know certain variables that distinguish individuals um, uh, can be uh, you know valuable information in terms of how people respond to certain foods or don't and when you start to scale that up with massive data sets you can extrapolate from that valuable information to provide um, you know, solid guidelines in terms of do's and don'ts, right? So that gets into the sort of citizen science aspect of, of the conversation that I wanna get into, but there were so many things in, in, in what you just said that I wanna tease out gradually. The first being just the realization that gut health, gut health the microbiome in so many ways holds this key to unlock you know, so many things that have befuddled scientists for so long. And there are a few things as complicated as nutrition. And, and certainly it's, you know, something that is so hotly debated. And, you know, it appears that it, it, it's so difficult to arrive at any kind of consensus around. And you talk about this in, in, in your books, uh, but what's really kind of empowering and fascinating about the microbiome is its mutability. Like when you look at genetics, you come with a, you know, this is your DNA, this is your, this is your genetic makeup. And you can say, well, you know, my, my dad got this or my grandfather got this. I have a genetic predisposition to this. And perhaps there's some mutability around the epigenetic piece, but there's not that much that we can do about it. But with the microbiome, there is this mutability, right? And trying to understand how to kind of maneuver around that you know, mutability and kind of push it in certain directions becomes the vanguard of this whole new kind of horizon of science and discovery. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a revelation because, you know, I was a geneticist. I've been finding genes, I'd been telling everyone that it's all a genetic basis. <laughs> Just blame your parents for everything, yeah. right? And hope- You're that, eating crow now. And, and hope that, as you said, you know, take this 
magic potion to tweak your epigenetics and you might, you've mm-hmm. got a chance of doing it. But it was a pretty depressing talk and I was sort of, you know, getting, getting myself down a bit about it. And so it was so um, empowering really to realize that, yeah, we're, we're, you know, identical twins have very different microbes and they respond differently to the same foods. You know, we had these identical twins. One would have a good fat response, the other a bad fat response. And the only thing we could find different was their microbes. So the fact that, you know, other studies before us, um, you know, this study, um, some out of UCSF had shown just by changing from vegan to meat-eating diets in four or five days, you can switch your gut microbes. You can do this stuff in a few days. Mm-hmm. So unimaginable to change your genes in that way. So mm-hmm. I think suddenly, you know, me personally, I was really energized to say this is really important and that small changes to your nutrition can have massive effects you know, via your gut microbiome if we get it right. And so everyone needs to know much more about gut health and the microbiome and treat it you know, just as you would look after it like you would your heart. Right, and getting it right is hard. That's a, that's a big, hard problem, right? It's well, we a, were starting it, from, yeah. It's a, a different, base. It, yeah, it's like this, I, I feel like you're kind of cresting this hill where for many years, it's been about trying to understand the nature and the complexity and just the general landscape in which the microbiome operates. And now we're in this kind of transitory period where it's about applying that understanding into kind of tangible you know, protocols or, or means of, of diagnosis and, and recommended therapies. Yeah, no, it, it's, um, uh, it's tough. And I think we, we mustn't, you know, again, realize that we know more than we do. And so mm-hmm. uh, we are just at the tip of this discovery. You know, the microbiome sequencing is is just getting to the point now where we're discovering all kinds of new um, elements to our gut microbiome. Like, you know, we've discovered this parasite that's in one in, f- one in, you know, one in four British people have this parasite called blastocystis. And it's only in one in 20 Americans. Mm-hmm. And we've, and if you have it, if you went to see your GP, uh, he'd probably say, look it up and say, okay, we've got to get rid of this guy. You know, it's been shown to cause diarrhea and bloody, you know, problems and whatever. Uh, you know, better kill it, let's get it out. But it turns out that if you've got it, you are uh, healthier, you've, you're skinnier, you've got less visceral fat, your blood lipid levels are lower, your blood pressure's lower, and it's a sign of super good health. And it's, um, you know, and so we're discovering that this, this parasite actually probably eats other microbes that mm. are uh, increasing your fat levels. So it's sort of, wow. it's a sort of predator of other microbes that we still don't understand which ones uh-huh. and having this effect. So, and it turns out all our ancestors had this blastocystis parasite. And if you look at all the data, whether it's modern day, you know, hunter gatherers or most third world countries, 100% of the populations have blastocystis and modern living has wiped it out. Mm. And, you know, we even see big differences between, you know, Midwest America and California. There's, you know, where healthier people are, it's a sign of healthy diets and healthy living. It's, uh, it's fascinating. This is, just one element of all these other, you know, we know nothing about the fungi, the parasites, the viruses, the phages that are doing all this stuff as well. So uh, let's, you know, we can't get ahead of ourselves. We've got to st- stick to the basics as we, as we learn and understand that, you know, we're all got different makeups and um, different bugs inside us that could be doing different things. Right, the insane complexity of all of it seems like a, a, a perfect, um, dynamic for uh, introducing the tools of the emerging tools of artificial ana- of artificial intelligence because they're so good at crunching massive data sets and and dealing with you know complexity at, at this kind of scale. Has there been any inroads with these these kind of emergent tools and how they might apply to this field? Well, we we think we've just about got to the level. So we've now got. We've been looking at our latest paper at 50,000 
uh, stool samples from the US and the UK, people who've taken the Zoe uh, tests. Mm -hmm. And with those numbers, that's, that's, that's where you start to get this real power. And so we're just starting that journey now to try and understand mm -hmm. it and link that with the health outcomes. Mm -hmm. But in a way, we are, we're doing this on a small level with our, with our studies at the moment that's allowed us to work out what we think a, a healthy microbiome looks like in most people. Mm -hmm. So what's the sort of key ingredients of a healthy microbiome, which has been quite elusive. Um, so we, you know, we've got a list of good and bad microbes that's getting bigger and bigger that we find if you get that ratio right, that's, that's, right. that's associated with all these good health, com health outcomes and associated with these um, healthy foods as well. So it's the link between the foods the microbes and the, and the health outcomes. Right, 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 right. But you need these big data sets, you know, like we did in genetics, before you really start to get uh, the clues out. That you know, if you're dealing with just hundreds of people, it's just we have too much variation to be able to deal with it. So. Right, and and those big data sets, you know, introduces this idea of of citizen science. And you know, I want to get to personalized nutrition, but I don't think we can really talk about that until we kind of uh, discuss the uh, you know the impact and the potential impact of of what this whole emerging world of citizen science is and the the kind of advent of these technologies by dint of Zoe and you know other you know other kind of uh, things that are out there that are allowing you to run you know incredible uh incredibly detailed experiments at a massive scale unprecedented in the history of science because um, you know, Will and I were, were chatting the other day and he was telling me like, listen, in testing or in science, historically, you can have a small population of peop people that you kind of control and you can get very detailed information out of them or you have population studies that are very general and basic because you lack that level of detail and control. And now because of these technology platforms and, and you know, in particular what Zoe is doing, you can get both, you can get the best of both, right? Which opens up a whole new world of, you know, kind of data analytics and the power of, uh, of the results that you're seeing to, you know, create predictive outcomes and, and again, like diagnostic tools. Yeah, no, I think it's it, it's a real game changer in science because you know in a very short period of time we've built up the largest microbiome database in the world. We're now uh, doing G, you know microbiome sequencing on two and a half thousand people a week and doubling that very soon because in a way people are paying for those tests themselves and they're all signing consent forms to say they agree to share that data mm -hmm. for science so that you know it's not just lost as it would be in any normal medical clinic or uh, private facility or whatever so it's all going back into a large database that we you know we've published I think Zoe's published like 40 papers now uh, on this kind of data so it is a whole new phase I think of science so rather than waiting five years to get a NIH grant or um, so slow, you can do this in real time mm -hmm. and get these results back. And I think my eyes were open to this. Um, you know, we'd, we'd started Zoe, but then a, the pandemic hit and um, 2020, and obviously everything, all our clinical studies stopped on the twins. And so while cycling home from, in London, I had the idea of, uh, asking, uh, repurposing the, the sort of Zoe app, which was based for nutrition to understand COVID and get COVID symptoms, et cetera. So it was a bit of a wild idea, but the, my colleagues, George and Jonathan loved it. The whole company loved it. And so in five days, we built this app, which um, went live, totally raw, full of mm -hmm. bugs, you know, and thought it would, flop, but at least we'd done our bit. And we had uh, a million people download it in 24 hours. So wow. we one of the biggest sort of health- How'd you manage that? Uh, social media. Mm. Everyone shared it, so this is a great idea. It was the first day of the lockdown in the UK. And uh, we launched it a, a week later in the US. And 
within two weeks, we had two million, and then we eventually got up to four million people using this app uh, at a time when there was people wanted to unite to do something, mm -hmm. and the government was useless. Um, you couldn't go and see your doctor. You know, you were told to stay at home. Um, you couldn't get tested. So it it just struck a chord, and. We were told no one over, over 60 is going to use an app, right? That was the other thing to say, well, you know, <laughs> technology is not for oldies, you know. It, it, they have to, be, you've got to send them a web page or, you yeah. know, a, or a questionnaire. Prove that wrong. You know, we had people in their 90s doing this. Um, and it, it, it absolutely took off. And so it became the number one tool in the UK for knowing out where outbreaks were happening and what was going on. And we learned also what the new symptoms were, which were not what we were told from the original Chinese uh, variant. And so uh, just in, in real time, we were seeing, uh, as people reported on the app, rather than old fashioned science of questionnaires and you know, waiting a year mm -hmm. to validate the paper and whatever, in real time, we, we got a system worked out with the team at Zoe so that we knew that um, loss of smell, for example, was being reported by you know a third of people who had you know had all these other symptoms of COVID or tested positive. So, right, so that's the origin of of how it was determined that loss of smell was a thing. Right, it came out of that originally. Clinicians noted it in in Italy, so they were saying it's strange. I've got you know um, ENT people were saying I think this seems something must be happening, but they couldn't tell, they couldn't do a proper study. So. Um, it was a combination of ha having that real data in uh, millions of people. Mm -hmm. And we presented it and, you know, suddenly WHO and all these other countries around the world um, changed their criteria. It was, it was the UK was the slowest to change, but interestingly, because they, they hadn't done the study themselves. But um, that, was, that was a wake up call about how fast this new way of doing science with new technology, with apps, citizen scientists working together could do so much. And we did lots of other stuff um, that I'm really, really proud of the, the team for doing, as well as the other symptoms. We found delirium in old people was a sign. Children got very different symptoms. We, we looked at skin. We, we asked people to send pictures of their skin rashes with COVID. Mm -hmm. I think we got 30,000 pictures. Wow. Um, and formed an atlas that, you know, people could see around the world. Um, we, um, there, was some, there was COVID tongues, so people were sticking their tongues out, taking pictures, you know, and suddenly people felt engaged for the first time they were doing something. And I think yeah. it was really important. We did a study that would have taken, you know, $5 million and five years to do where we, we asked a million people to fill in a diet questionnaire um, in the US and the UK and, and looked at their severity of COVID they got you know, a year later. Mm. And with that data, we clearly showed that diet quality was one of the biggest factors in determining uh, how you were likely to die or to stay in hospital, or have really serious COVID, a link with the immune system and nutrition. So and this is all done at the speed of light. We were writing papers right. in a few days. Yeah, um, shocking. I mean, how, so four million crazy. people, how many people are on the app now? Uh, we have about, there's uh, still about 300,000 still logging uh -huh. uh, daily. And we've, but we've, it's, so it's three years on now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's obviously come down from the millions that were doing it, but we've repositioned it um, into a health study app. So we've we got consent to study more than just COVID and We've now using it to do other lifestyle factors. So we realize its potential. And so um, we, uh, for example, have just finished a study on intermittent fasting. So mm -hmm. we've got 140,000 people to agree uh, to change their method of eating to eat in a, a time restricted eating window of 10 hours. And we, repurposed the app and, and gave them so they could fill this in and tell us how they were doing in terms of their mood, their sleep, their appetite, um, uh, their weight, any other, any other factors we wanted to. And uh, 
got this launch really fast. And amazingly, most people, and they could do the fasting whenever they wanted. So we were also looking, it's a way of looking at not just does it work, but how practical is this? You know, because you have these tiny studies done on 10 people, mm -hmm. hand-picked volunteers yeah. from Stanford. I mean, what can you, know? you really uh, extrapolate from that that's meaningful? Yeah. So it was really cool to see how many people managed to do it. And I think it was about 80% or something managed to do it for a, at least three weeks, at least you know, five or six days a week of just eating in a 10-hour window. And you know, we're still writing up the paper, so I can't give you all the, um, the details, but it was super encouraging because the people that did manage to do that 10 hours you know, reported all kinds of benefits on some of their GI health, you know, many of them mm -hmm. were less bloating, uh, mood improved, and interestingly, appetite didn't go up because mm. you know, we're all told, well, if you... And there were differences between men and women, differences in different ages, uh, but the fact we could do this massive study um, at very little cost uh, in, in such rapid time really means, for me, this it really is the future of how we can particularly do subjects that don't get the funding. You know, the, the sort of studies about who's going who's gonna to give you big money to do I don't know, meditation right. or uh, right. yoga or right, right, right. Um, five minutes exercise or... Um, going to bed earlier or, uh, you know, cutting back our alcohol or, you know, just seeing what are the practical cold showers, you know, who knows, you know, these things. Mm -hmm. You get, you know, the, you get the aficionados who tell you, yes, you know, the, the dedicated gurus say, if you do this, it always works, all anecdote. What, what about the real, you know, the person on the street, how good, useful mm -hmm. is it for them? How easy is it to do? Fascinating the people, you know, because we're told like intermittent fasting works better if you um, you you do your fasting later at, at night, so you don't eat after right. say five p.m. Right, 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 right. Yeah, like that ten-hour window. When is that ten-hour window? And what are the age of these people? And what are the foods that they are eating when they break so, their fast? There's all kinds of variables, and then beyond that, there's adherence issues. And are these well, people even being honest, you know, well, with what they're reporting? None of these things are useful if you can't right. adhere. It's like diets, right? Mm -hmm. Completely pointless if you can't stay on it long term. So, finding out that you know only about a quarter of people. Uh, in the UK preferred to, to do their fasting late at night, i.e. You know, have an early meal mm -hmm. and then uh, most people, it was easier in their lifestyle to like delay or skip breakfast. And that's just really useful to know that saying, well, actually for most people, even if it's not quite as good biologically, they can keep, probably keep that going for years. Mm -hmm. So it's much better rather than this purist idea that this is the only thing right. that people like should do. Like what's, what's replicable and sustainable. Uh, yeah, and if you do that, then are you eating at, you're, you're probably eating dinner at six or seven as opposed to 10 at night and what's the implications of that? But the real power, it seems, comes in when you, when you layer on top of that, all kinds of other uh, sort of biometrics from heart rate variability, the, 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 the glucose monitor that's showing how you're metabolizing you know, your food, um, resting heart rate, you know, metabolic rate, all these things with these you know, kind of devices now that all you know, establish a matrix of variables that you can then compare and contrast to draw you know, a more kind of uh, intelligent conclusion from just, I feel better or I slept better. But well, actually, if I look at this, you were, your deep sleep, number increased or your REM went up or it went down. Yeah, I think that's the, the next like, phase. Right? That's the next yeah. phase I think is to, having shown this works at a, a sort of crude level, is to try and get people to input, you know, either automatically or semi-manually mm -hmm. some of these, these inputs and then uh, rework some of the, this data. And we want to also, with people doing the Zoe, the paid Zoe program, also start having some of these interventions as well. So that, you know, you know, every every wave of different week might do a different intervention. Mm -hmm. So we can actually see, well, can you personalize some of these lifestyle things? Well, can you predict who's gonna do better? 
are you, is there a certain cold shower person? Is there a certain mm -hmm. early fasting person? Can you predict who they are as well? So I think the more you can combine these things together with these interventions as opposed to just observation, mm -hmm. um, the more you can do it. And everything we've seen is people are super willing to take part. You know, even if they've been paying money, they, they, they like the idea of being in these large experiments as long as you give them, you feed back the data. So in the past, researchers like myself have been grabbing all the information you can and then five years later, you get a little, you know, a note saying, thank you, we published it in Nature. You know, you pray for God what it was. Right. Thanks for your help. Now it's very much, you know, you've done the study, people want to know how they got on, how they compared to other people. And it's, this is what we have to start to do much better than we've done in the past. But I think it's, I think it's really exciting. I wish we'd discovered this uh, 20 years ago. Well, these things happen. It wouldn't have been when, possible. Yeah, the technology has to, you know, be robust enough, right? And I, you know, to your point, we are at the very beginning of this. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's privacy concerns, there's other kind of issues that need to be kind of properly navigated. Um, but it is exciting, and I think it answers um, a critical question uh, that that I'm sure gets posed to you from your critics around like. Okay, so you're making these breakthroughs and you're trying to understand, you're understanding better what's happening with the microbiome, et cetera, and everything that's going on, you know, on your platform, but like, why does this matter? Like, how are we translating this into anything actionable? Like, what is the reality of personalized uh, medicine versus the promise or the hype? And, you know, how close are we to kind of, uh, um, bridging that gap between our aspiration and you know what we're actually capable of of providing you know the interested consumer. Yeah, well, there's certainly plenty of critics of personalized nutrition, which is what mm -hmm. you know, we were into, as opposed to medicine. I mean, because that's in a way the personalized medicine has been discussed before, particularly with regard to genetics and uh, genetic testing and things like that. And, Selecting drugs on the basis right. of those things. We won't remember the blood type diet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. That was a, a, a fantastic <laughs> yeah. example. That's right. Yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of rubbish. Yeah. But the the new era of personalized nutrition. A, a we've we've published, you know, peer review papers in Nature Medicine, you know, high quality mm -hmm. journals to show there are these big individual differences that are real. Um, we have. Uh, performed a, a randomized controlled trial of, sort of unpersonalized approaches, you know, standard US advice versus uh, people doing the ZOE program. Um, we haven't unblinded the results, but I can, uh, I'm looking at it, I'm, I'm very confident they're, uh, they're gonna be good. So the randomized controlled trial is the best way to, to tell whether it's mm -hmm. better than you know, uniform advice. Um, and I think the other, the other reason is that as soon as something's personalized to you, you're much more likely to take, um, believe it. I think that's what we've shown in all of these, all of these citizen science ideas, that if you can make it, this is your response, it's not just the average response. It's not like everybody, you know, Mm -hmm. who goes on this diet does well. We know that you respond to this, you will do it. So your adherence to it is much more likely. Your, your level of belief is so much higher. And if that's backed up by science, then um, I think, you know, it's inevitable it's gonna happen. So these critics, yes, we need to do these big studies. We need to do the randomized controlled trials. These critics are generally, you know, hanging on to the past and old style nutrition and they will be dropping off. This, mm -hmm. this is absolutely the, the future. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, yes, we won't be able to sort out all the problems. Um, you know, we're a long way from, I don't know, working out exactly how much protein every individual has because we don't have ways of measuring protein response in the body and things. But, you know, for, for glucose uh, and for lipid levels and, and assessing how much those people need, I think we're we're doing a pretty good job now. So, um, and you know, I think the studies will show that people um, feel better. 
uh, anecdotally, we, the people were saying they felt better, and, and the randomized control trials mm -hmm. actually are saying saying the same thing. And uh, I think the the bit we've always been forgotten about nutrition, which we didn't know, is things like energy. Um, it's never really been asked before in nutrition trials. You know, what's your mood and energy like when you change from, say, a high fat or a high low, or you know, whatever it is, you switch around to something that suits you, and you don't get these spikes in your sugar or you don't get this, your triglycerides hanging around your body, which means you get less inflammation. We're seeing that in, in everything we do is this, this report of, I feel more energy. Right. And I think that's, that's, that's really important. So it's not just about weight and uh, you know, the, the sort of external stuff. It's, it's finding out what foods m make you feel good. And mm -hmm. uh, well, you know this from running, you know? It's, yeah, of course, of sports, course. People do this by trial and error. Yeah, but, but the average non-sports person you know, has to rely on other other tricks to do it. And may not have thought about it in the same way as a performance athlete. Right. Um, one of the diagnostic tools that you're using for this is the continuous glucose monitor, um, and that you know I want to talk more broadly about metabolic health in general and how that relates to the microbiome. But with respect to CGMs. Um, there's there's a lot of squabbling around that as well. There's a certain kind of subset of the type one diabetic community that that seems unhappy with the fact that this is available to consumers more broadly. And I, you know, I believe that that comes from perhaps an affordability or access perspective. Um, there's another kind of contingent of people who don't like it because they think that uh, you know, kind of. A, an undue fixation on CGM metrics alone paints, uh, you know, an incomplete picture of what you should or should not be eating, et cetera. Um, and there's, you know, kind of the whole the whole like biohacker community around it um, that's drawing uh, conclusions that aren't necessarily completely solid because of an over reliance on on that variable over kind of a matrix of of complementary value. So, can you talk a little bit about um, the benefits and and perhaps the limitations of the use of a CGM? Like I've used it, I found it to be super interesting. Um, I I drew a lot of you know kind of um, non intuitive conclusions about my lifestyle habits and certain foods that were contributing to spikes and valleys, et cetera. Um, but I think without adequate education, it's very easy for a consumer to perhaps adopt less than savory dietary habits because their sole focus is on like flattening that curve. We agree on that. Um, so, you know, for anyone who hasn't tried it, they are an amazing educational tool about how your body works. Okay, so it's, it's like you suddenly do this amazing science experiment on yourself and seeing how your body's reacting in real time, which is kind of, you know, it, it's amazing really. You, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have dreamt this would be mm -hmm. possible. And, and, and we think that within five years, you know, most of the smartwatches might actually have some capability to do this as well. So it, it's not going away. Um, like any new technology, it's gonna be misused by some people or overused or overhyped, et cetera. And yeah. So, certainly for the type one diabetics, there was a time when they were run out of supply, so they couldn't get it. And mm -hmm. absolutely understand why they were angry. People just doing it for fun when, you know, they're risking, right. uh, um, you know, fatal hypos without them. So they're incredibly useful, but the, um, they are, the, a, a complaint against uh, Zoe was that they weren't very reliable. We did a study where we gave 300 users, uh, one on each arm and looked at those and they, they worked out really pretty well for the purposes we're using it. Um, we've also looked at whether, you know, compared to standard blood tests, they are, do they add anything to just taking a baseline blood sugar and insulin level and a HbA1c? And by looking at over your two weeks, your time in range, and the very glycemic variability, uh, you can predict who's unwell or not better than those baseline tests. So there is an, we've shown there's a clear advantage even in normal people mm -hmm. to having them as a sort of predictive tool. There are, 
lots of ways of misusing them. And I, I agree that if you don't have a clear program with it that puts it into some context, you would, you know, using it just as a toy, uh, you reach some wrong conclusions. And one of the common ones is that the only way to eat is to have a completely flat. Uh, right. If you eat a 100% fat diet, yeah. like you're gonna have an awesome curve, you right? Do, you it's just gonna put, be flat. Exactly, you, <laughs> just, you just put ice cream on everything or yeah. whatever it is and you know, you just, you just cream on everything, you, you sort it out and clearly that's wrong. And, it, and that's why something with Zoe, we, we see it's just one of, the, of these three tests really. It's, it's, it's one part of the, your score is your glycemic score, but we need to know how you handle fats uh, and that's why the Zoe test has a, a blood prick spot and your six hour triglyceride test, see how much is hanging around. And of course your gut microbes and those, you know, we need a more holistic view of it mm -hmm. rather than getting obsessed about that one increment of it because you have to, if you are gonna control your blood spikes if for sugar, you gotta make sure that you're not giving yourself too much fats, so you're tipping that so your, your fats are hanging around the blood, you're gonna get atherosclerosis and inflammation. And also the foods you're eating are also good for your gut microbes. So if you have a more holistic view of it, then I think it, 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 it is reasonable to use these. And I think they are a great educational tool to show people that some of the common things they were eating, like their standard sliced loaf bread, which they thought was super healthy, is giving them this massive spike, which you know mm -hmm. what mine looks like if I ate supermarket bread, um, and certain fruits, for example, that they thought were super healthy, and like me, you know, bananas, you know, which I used to take as my standard every single day fruit, not particularly good for me. I think these are things that are useful because they start making you think about food in a different way, and I think, uh, but out of context, I think. They can be dangerous to some people, but if you think about it, you also got to think about your fats. You got to think about how good that food is for your gut microbes, and accept that you will all, yeah, you can still have some sugar spikes every now and again. Uh, it's normal. That's physiology. Let's not get obsessed about it. But um, seeing it in real time it is is kind of cool, and that's a glimpse, I think, of the future. You know, they'll soon someone will invent a lipid test in real time, and it'll be on your watch soon, so you'll be able to see. How these uh, right all of these different readings about what's happening in real time within in your, your body. body? I think it's inevitable, yeah, which uh, is interesting and fascinating. But like a real basic question here is like, why should we care about this? Like we see, you know, let's say you have a CGM, you see the, you know, the the your blood glucose go up, it goes down. Why is this important? What is metabolic health, and why should we, you know, be paying attention to this in the first place? These spikes in sugar and or triglycerides are part of normal physiology. So, you know, our body is designed to do that way. But if there's too many of them and the spikes are too prolonged, you either get a buildup of, uh, so the, the sugar spikes will create rise in insulin, which can, can start getting um, insulin resistance and Long term, you might end up more likely to get diabetes, pushing you towards prediabetes, et cetera. And that build up in triglycerides um, are particularly related to inflammation. And you get inflammation in the blood vessels over time, that stress builds up. And again, heart disease and other mm -hmm. metabolic problems. So it's the idea is that if you can calm that down, so you're not having as many of those spikes in the day, then you're inflammation levels are lower and we've, we've shown that they are related to blood inflammation markers. You will reduce your risk of many common chronic diseases, most of which are related to some extent to what we call chronic inflammation, the sort of low level stress in the body. And other studies have shown that people who have, um, are prone to these sugar spikes end up long term with more diabetes and heart disease. So there are, there are sort of mm -hmm. links you can make epidemiologically. We also know that some of these big spikes we showed, uh, there's something called a sugar dip. So one in, one in three men, one in three women, one in four uh, men, after a carby, say breakfast or, or, or lunch, three hours later, we'll have a dip below baseline. And 
you say, well, okay, that's not something to worry about, but we, we followed uh, a large number of these people and it turns out they um, report being more tired. Uh, they don't know what their result, they were blind to their result. They were more tired, um, they were more hungry, and they overate by uh, about 300 calories mm -hmm. that day. So these sugar dips, which you get from highly refined foods and carbs, are actually making you overeat as well. So they, over time, will make you gain much more weight than someone who's not having these, uh, these right. dips. So some people are even more susceptible than others. And what is the relationship between metabolic health and the microbiome? Like how does uh, a robust, healthy microbiome in turn uh, help you maintain uh, a healthy, uh, you know, a, a, a healthy metabolic, you know, sort of uh, profile. We don't know is the mm -hmm. is the true answer, but we do know that uh, all the epidemiology studies show that people with poor metabolic health, so with type two diabetes, with obesity, with high blood pressure, with autoimmune disease, inflammation, all have uh, low diversity microbes. Uh, poor ratios of good to bad bugs. So there's a clear association mm -hmm. there. And then you can do worse studies in mice to uh, show a cause effect relationship of these sort of inflammatory microbes that are maybe producing chemicals that are making the whole problem worse. So it, it's a bit of a vicious circle. So the microbiome reacts to metab people with poor metabolic health end up getting unhealthier microbes. But we also know that having unhealthy microbes makes you more likely to also have poor metabolic health. So it's, 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 a, you know, it's both cause and effect relationships. Mm -hmm. So we don't understand exactly how they do all this. Um, there's so many chemicals involved, so many microbes involved that um, we don't yet know the details, but we do know that there's these very clear associations and that you can improve metabolic health so sort of dramatically in a lot of animal models by improving the, the microbes or uh, things like fecal transplants in mice and things like this. So, right. Know, so in other words, if you if you are are getting indicia that that um, you're having some level of insulin resistance, um, the immediate kind of first thing to do would be to make sure that you're getting thirty varieties of plants in your diet, like improving the quality of your microbiome, which in turn may have some positive impact on um, buttressing against that insulin sensitivity. Yes. Is that, is that a leap or is that? No, I think, that, but that's, a, that's general for most of the chronic diseases that mm -hmm. are related to inflammation. So yes, we know that people who have poor metabolic health have pro-inflammatory microbes. They have species that actually thrive off, you know, the stressed cytokines and, and all these other uh, stress hormones. And if you, can, if you can change those and get some of the good guys in there instead and drive down the bad ones, right. you can uh, reduce some of the, the, mm. the impact of those diseases. So mm. these haven't been studied in big enough um, nutritional trials yet, but everything points that that is, that is the direction we should go in. And it, so far, we, for most of these diseases, they don't seem to be very specific microbes that are involved. It's more the general community is, is all changed. So it's just the environment has just shifted. Mm -hmm. And it could be something subtle just by changing the pH mm -hmm. of the gut, just a fraction makes a big difference between it being you know, beneficial or, or pro-inflammatory and itself producing more of the problems. Mm. That's fascinating. And you know, as this continues to scale up, obviously you'll continue to learn more, right? Yeah, and you know, and, you know um, Christopher Gardner, I know you're probably gonna be talking to him soon, did a really uh, neat study where gave intensive amounts of fermented foods to, um, to volunteers and looked at their inflammation and immune levels over the next few weeks. And they showed uh, one, one arm was given just fiber and the other one was given fermented foods. And mm -hmm. um, both groups improved to some extent, but the one that had the biggest immune impact and reduced inflammation was the fermented foods group. Mm -hmm. So we know we can change in just a few weeks, quite a lot of these, these basic mechanisms that are important to so many chronic diseases. And yet most doctors never 
suggest these as treatments. They always, you know, reach for the uh, the prescription pad. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's amazing how fast that is too. Yeah, how exactly. mutable it really is. Th that was the surprising thing that it just uh, it was it was four weeks of intensive meal deliveries. Um, so they knew, you know, they were they were getting this this stuff, uh, and then they had four weeks where they were just trying it on their own. But it was. Um, mm. uh, you know, the results really were very striking and that's what it had a really big impact. But no mm. one had done those studies before, which is sort right. of shocking as well. Right, right, right. Because we just said, oh, well, that's just yogurt. That's not real uh -huh. treatment, you know, that's, uh, that's hippie stuff. You know, we don't, we don't believe in that. But <laughs> these, you know, luckily they did all, as, you know, a huge range of, of blood tests and, and microbe tests. So yeah, in a few weeks, you can really change your, your gut health and influence disease. And I think that's, that's the message. And, this whole mess about why you know medicine, why, why food really is medicine, and we should right. come back to that, you know, and not start saying, well, that you have to be a nutter if you say yeah. that, you know. Did did Hippocrates actually say that, or is that apocryphal? Uh, I, we don't know. I, I haven't seen his original <laughs> text, so. Yeah. Uh, I, but. Uh, it's nice to think he would have said it. I, I, I like to believe that as well. Um, the other uh, kind of really exciting, interesting field where we're seeing a lot of exciting developments is in at the intersection of the microbiome and cancer research, right? So um, explain a little bit about what's going on with that, um, specifically with respect to, to melanoma and to some extent, um, even lymphoma, right? Yeah, well, it all comes down to this new approach to cancer, which is to realize that it's actually an immune problem rather than a sort of mutation problem. Um, because we're all getting micro cancers all the time and our immune system, if it's healthy, is picking them off before they get too big. And so that's why the immune system aging and cancer have got this sort of close link. We've never really, uh, realize how important it was until these immunotherapy drugs come, have come along, these so-called checkpoint inhibitors, which have been sort of game changers for many people with some of these solid tumors, uh, particularly melanoma, but to a lesser extent, kidney and lung and mm. um, some prostate, that you're using these drugs to boost the immune system to attack the um, uh, uh, the cancer cell and get round its defenses. And um, so, you know, mortality rates were sort of, you know, not 95% and they've, these drugs have really ch changed it. So they're sort of half, you know, they've halved, doubled the survival rate in, in, the, in these particular conditions. It doesn't uh, affect most cancers, but these ones. And what we've seen is that the, uh, there were some early studies showing that the microbiome had, might have a role in this and that uh, the state of the microbiome was, was important because uh, it was interacting, because uh, as I mentioned, how important it is for the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want a really powerful immune response in order to fight that cancer for that drug to work. Uh, so there are a few early studies of this suggesting this might be the case. And uh, we got together with a, a UK charity and got a consortium of um, other uh, cancer centers in the UK and the Netherlands. And we got uh, several hundred melanoma cases end stage. These are people with terminal sort of metastatic cancer going through their immunotherapy and saw how they did over a year. And it, it turned out that the state of their gut microbiome at the beginning was one of the biggest predictors of whether they would um, survive or not, mm. and as expected, it was you know the good to bad ratio, loss of um, diversity, and it, we also looked at their diets, and uh, it was the lack of fibre and positive aspects. Of those that followed a more Mediterranean diet had like double the rate of success of survival, and you know these these figures aren't trivial. It's not a just tiny amount. If you know real difference between double your chances of success of uh, reaching 12 months. Wow. And yet, how many patients know, you know, the importance of this? Uh, yeah, hardly, yeah, yeah, hardly yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. How many oncologists 
discuss uh, diet as in in such a powerful way. And um, there's you know there's been some studies in, in for chemotherapy that haven't been very clear or very large, uh, which is you know this where you just sort of try and kill all the cells. Um, and there are um, some hospitals like I think it's um, Sloan Kettering um, or, or MD Anderson, where they, they actually, if you're going through chemotherapy, they will take a sample of your gut microbiome and they'll store it in freezers. You have your chemotherapy, then they give it back to you as a booster. Mm -hmm. And so, and they've got data that improves survival as well. So you- I mean, that makes perfect sense. It's common, I mean, you're saying, it's immediately what I thought of, like no matter how robust and great your microbiome is, if you're going into chemo or radiation, it's gonna get obliterated, right? Yes. So to culture it and be able to, you know, supplement or kind of, you know, uh, a lot, you know have, have a way of repairing that as you go along would seem to be kind of crucial and obvious. Yeah, and I think, we're all going to be storing our microbiome when we yeah. think we're at our healthiest. Mm -hmm. It's always hard to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> trust me, I'm going to get into fecal transplants. Like we, yeah, we should all we should have banks where we're where we're storing this stuff at our healthiest, right? So, yeah. you know, when we face some kind of crisis, we have the ability to kind of turbocharge our 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 microbiome, and in turn our immune system so yeah. that we can meet whatever we're facing in, it, the, in the best way. And as you said, there's some other examples in lymphoma, something called CART therapy is very complicated uh -huh. uh, using uh, T cells. And mm. the microbiome again is, is proving crucial in those uh, you know, lymphoma, just like a type of leukemia. So I think we're gonna see more and more of this. And I, I'm, I think the cancer area is one that the public can really relate to. And, this might be finally the barrier that gets it across to the medical profession how important uh, diet is uh, t and diet mm -hmm. and gut health because medics are still not being taught anything about this this whole area and nutrition is still sidelined as a minor thing. But if we can show how important it is in cancer, then hopefully um, everyone will be convinced and the word will get out. But cancer patients are traditionally told to avoid fermented foods, right? Uh, they are, yeah, they certainly are in many places. And I, I get lots of complaints from, from patients saying- um, Because what is the rationale? Uh, I think it comes to the days when at some point in chemotherapy, you, you, you are very vulnerable to infections. Mm -hmm. And so you have very few white cells to, to fight infection. And so they're worried about introducing bugs. And obviously, at that nadir in your treatment, you don't want to be given large amounts of micros. But for the vast majority of people, most of the time, these fermented foods could actually be saving their lives. So there's a lot of misinformation out there and that um, we need to you know, get oncologists and, and doctors up to speed on, on this, this new area. And mm -hmm. it's, it's moving very fast. But fermented foods are really good for your immune system and as far as I know, that you know, they've they've never killed anybody who isn't who's got a few you know decent white some white cells. Yeah. So so paint the picture of of what the future in your mind looks like from a personalized um, medicine perspective and a diagnostic and treatment perspective when you're able to perform you know really uh, dialed in specific citizen science and you know data crunching to you know create um, to create really powerful tools to treat better in a more bespoke way I mean what does that look like in the you like I'm imagining how far how yeah, far like, in the future are we well talking? maybe like you know 10 years from now and 50 years from now like I've I've had futurists on here I've heard mm -hmm. you know like I think what's happening in I terms can't go of beyond 10 years yeah, I'm sorry well like you know there's a lot of interesting breakthroughs and developments in scanning and early detection and all of these things that are, are, I think are really powerful in terms of catching things early on. Like so much of what we perish from uh, is avoidable if we could have caught it earlier. And, you know, kind of the technology is getting to a point where we're gonna be able to detect these things so early on that we can, you know, deal with them in a really facile manner, you know, before they become problematic. Uh, but that's early treatment. The, yeah, that's way. yeah, early treatment, right? 
And, and what you're talking about is just another piece in that, in that broader puzzle um, in terms of like where medicine and healthcare are, are heading. But you know, what, is your, what does it look like from what well, you're seeing? Well, I'd love to see more about prevention rather than sort of early treatment and reverse you know, the major threat to the Western world, which is our poor diet, mm-hmm. which you know, is, is essentially killing us and uh, giving half the population of the US you know, make diabetes and obesity. And it's an insane statistic. And so, think about it. you know, ultra processed food is the, is the number one killer in this. And the studies are clearly linking ultra processed foods and microbiome dysfunction. And we've just let it happen. You know, we just let all these chemicals come into our food system uh, without a proper testing. And the science is now showing that many of these emulsifiers that glue stuff food together, um, the artificial sweeteners, the sugar alcohols, all these things that you see in ultra processed foods have a negative effect on our microbiome. So, you know, I'd like to see a future where we're not just fighting an ever increasing number of diseases with, with expensive MRI scans. We're actually gonna do something at a population epidemiology level to say, you know, these foods, they're like, they couldn't have cigarettes in the 1970s, you know, they should have health warnings on them, not um, uh, health promotion benefits right. to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. this is healthy because yeah. it's got some vitamin Iron D. Iron or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, some like, nonsense in it. yeah, fortified with vitamin it's C a, or D yeah, or K. There should K be a warning that says, if it comes, yeah. if it comes with uh, some health advice, it's bad for you. You know, that, <laughs> that would be a, a, a good <laughs> sticker. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really into prevention uh, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna see that the tools for, you know, rather than trusting in doctors, that individuals are empowered to do this themselves. I think this is the way it's gonna happen. And we've seen already, you know, how these devices are changing people's lives just in the last few years. The glucose monitor, there'll be the lipid monitor. Um, we know all the major smartwatch manufacturers are, are gonna moving towards this, they'll have, mm laser devices that will be able to pick up different blood measures in, in you in real time. These will be fed back through algorithms in your phone. And, uh, you know, the vision of, of uh, companies like Zoe is to also tell people not only what's happening to their body in real time, but what they're eating in real time. So with the complexity of the ultra processed food, it's very hard to know what you're actually eating. Mm-hmm. How bad is it? How many of these chemicals are bad for you? Are you the one in three people that reacts to carrageenan, you know, which is an emulsifier that will glue your microbes together but not other people's? You know, you, which artificial sweetener, if you have to have one, you know, would you have? This per- level of personalization can only be so complicated, you need apps and advice to be able to do it, to guide you through it. So I think we'll be using these devices to find our way uh, through the food jungle, mm-hmm. point us to say what, Ideally, we should be eating, keep us logged about how, the, you know, how well are we doing in our 30 plants a week, hints of new things to try and telling us when we should be taking our exercise um, relative to where our last night's sleep was. Um, everything should be optimized, but also not just making us robots, but making us more intelligent, more educated about what we're doing mm-hmm. so that we realize that, you know, this is an evolving science and, it, and if everyone is part of a, a giant citizen science project, then everyone benefits. And I think that's, that's my vision of the future is that we will have this sort of benevolent um, companies, if you like, there'll be a, a group of people who can pay for all these um, tools, but that information will pass to the people that can't pay for them and they will get predicted scores that are free and um, we'll, we'll move to a time when this is possible. So realizing that, you know, as we talk about cancer, yes, you can have an MRI scan that can detect that cancer early, but wouldn't you be better to know how to boost your immune system so that your immune cells do it, beat that cancer mm-hmm. before it's even detected by the MRI scanner? And yeah. rather than rely upon uh, the food pyramid, that's the result of a political process to have a 
personalized food pyramid that is specific to you and you alone, which is what you talk about in the new book. Yeah. yeah I think this this is definitely the future, but it but it's also understanding what the foods we're eating and you know and moving away from this old fashioned idea of calories. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's talk about that. Like it's a good segue okay. into, into the new book, but let's bust a few diet myths, right? Okay. Like Quick macros, calorie counting, like come at me. Like I, I know you got a lot to say about this kind of thing. They exist, but you know, their importance has been massively hyped. And the idea you can describe food by calories and by macronutrients has been exploited to the nth degree by the food companies. And that's why they can sell us all these products with these health claims on them. When we know they're rotten, they're artificial, you know, they're just, they're fake food. Mm -hmm. But because they have the right macronutrients on the label, they get a nice tick and we're, we're poisoning ourselves. So I think, you know, we haven't really changed in a hundred years our basic concept of how to discuss uh, nutrition uh, properly. And it, we're only just starting to get into this discussion of what ultra processed food is and the different levels of food processing, which the food industry doesn't want us to discuss because the last thing they want is some definition that they would have to mm-hmm. um, apply to. So they, they are keeping muddying the water on it. So the, the fact that they, you know, the, the companies, um, you know, I discuss this in the book, you know, love the idea of calories. They love calorie things on menus and they're describing food by its, as if you can tell if it's food good or bad by its calorie count and its fat content. Um, it's complete nonsense. There is no real correlation and there are good and bad fats and there is good and bad calories, uh, foods. You know, we need to be focusing on the quality of, of food and that's totally clear. Um, like the example I gave you in the Zoe study of people given an identical calorie muffin and some people react to that in a very different way and get a sugar dip and will overeat by 300 calories later in the day, others won't. Um, If you describe food purely in terms of that, Mm -hmm. uh, all calories are equal and you just gave everyone these bad bad foods, you, you wouldn't know that that this is what this effect they're having on mood and energy and everything else. So smoke screen that we just need to get rid of. And we need to start talking about quality of foods and what's whole food, you know, what's a whole plant food, not these uh, foods that are made uh, in a way to falsify real food. You know, they're, 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 they're designed to reformulate actual food uh, using fake ingredients, mm-hmm. extracts. And I think that's, you know, um, no one denies that calories exist, but, you know, we can go into the whole thing about why calorie calorie counting diets fail the vast majority of people. It will work for a few weeks, then your body just readjusts just as, uh, and bounces back. The same way um, exercise for most people does the same um, because your body adapts Mm -hmm. to that exercise you know, we're not just furnaces, we're finely tuned machines that, that change. So these are concepts that have just stayed because of the, the market, the force of the calorie counting diet market, the force of the food industry trying to sell us um, worse and worse food with more and more health claims. Mm-hmm. And I think the science is now uh, out there to show how sort of irrelevant they are and how they are just a smoke screen. Yeah, it, it, there's sort of a, an arms race also because as the public becomes increasingly more and more aware of the, the ills of ultra processed foods, at the same time, the giant conglomerate food companies are getting better and better and better at dialing in palatability and the addictive nature of these foods with the exact recipe or combination of salt, sugar, and fat to kind of light up the dopamine centers and make it impossible to just have one. So it creates this this sort of compulsive relationship with foods we know are not good for us. And yet we find ourselves powerless to deny, 
right? So education takes us to a certain place and you know, human frailty and weakness, uh, you know, accounts for the rest. So, you know, it's 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 yeah. sticky to like. Well, I've got no. Yeah. I don't really have a beef with foods that are obviously unhealthy but super tasty, right? Um, but when something is wrapped up in a in in all this healthy packaging and is sold to you as a healthy, low calorie, mm-hmm. low fat alternative, uh, that's you know. That's criminal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 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 like dressing up cigarettes as uh, as healthy because they they're low in like it used to be low tar or low nicotine, therefore they're fine. You know, right? They're yeah, that's return. that's We've like a, that the now, sort of the tobacco a... company version of greenwashing. It makes us just feel a little bit better about that purchase. You know, making that purchase. Exactly. So, you know, let's have. We're not gonna get rid of them, but let's, let's have them with health warnings. Let's have them with a tax that reflects the huge burden on the, on the taxpayer that all these foods are costing us. You know? So it's hundreds of billions of dollars a year um, just because of we're eating these foods. And why should the taxpayer be basically paying for all this when the food companies are making all the money? And, and, you know, and they're getting massive subsidies to do it, and whereas, Anyone producing whole plants and fruits is not getting the, those same subsidies. So right, it's wrong. You, right. I mean, I agree with you completely. Uh, but then it becomes a question of political will and kind of penetrating the you know the battalion of lobbyists who are you know very invested in the status quo. Yeah, so it's, most well, countries well, have this while problem. we're all getting yeah. diabetes and becoming obese and dying there will of be a point when the country illnesses. just won't be able to afford it. You know, the healthcare system is broken. So it's, it is, and it's a national, sec- it becomes a national security issue, honestly. Like it, it's, it's a really huge problem and yet it continues to persist and, and metastasize, which is disturbing. But perhaps we can, you know, Pivot to a more optimistic or 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 helpful uh, conversation around like how to guide people towards those better choices. I mean, we all know more fruit, more fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds. You know, that's the kind of thumbnail. But for the 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 conscious consumer who's just going to the supermarket and shopping for their family and is on some level of budget, what are some of the kind of guiding principles about what to avoid and and you know what to invest in? Well, there's a lot to avoid, um, but there were, in writing the book, I, there were some surprising findings that I, I found that things that are relatively cheap aren't always, aren't always unhealthy. So things in cans, um, many studies have shown that some canned tomatoes can have uh, higher nutrient levels than uh, fresh tomatoes, for example. Um, get a can of beans, they're just as healthy as um, getting you know, dried beans and uh, doing them yourself. And they're often extremely cheap, really good source of protein. Mm-hmm. Most frozen vegetables and berries are also highly nutritious uh, and really good for you and cost virtually nothing. So um, we tend to think of anything frozen or in cans or in packaging as all the same. Is absolutely not true. As long as the, the source it is, it doesn't have, you know, uh, an artificial source in it. It's going to be really good for you. So that that was a surprising finding for that many of these these products you can get out of season. Frozen berries, for example, out of the freezer, really good for you. Um, nuts and you know, there's nothing wrong with nuts as a snack. Um, and there's a big difference between um, some artificially created. Um, uh, snacks like I don't know, you know, things like Pringles, which mm-hmm. have very little potato in them. They're actually made of all kinds of a composite of other things, versus some artisan potato chips that you can get that only have potato and olive oil or sunflower oil. Um, so there are some surprising ones in there, but uh, the jar- unfortunately, the vast majority of ready meals. Uh, that you buy have large lists of ingredients in them that you can't, wouldn't find in your home. And they're the ones that will cause you problems. They will make you overeat and they will be bad for your gut microbes. And I think that's a really important 
educational message that needs to get out there is that it's not about the fat, it's not about the calories. It's the fact they have this really harmful effect on your immune system mm -hmm. and you're gonna eat more and more of them. So they might be cheaper, but you're gonna, they're, they're made for a purpose so that you'll be overeating your family uh, and you will put on weight and have all these other diseases. So I think it's this education about what's wrong with certain foods that are, you know, ultra refined, have no fiber, very little nutrients, get into your bloodstream quickly, don't fill you up. And uh, they're just plain wrong. We weren't designed by evolution to eat them. Right. And, uh, that, so to my mind, it's, it's, it's an educational um, way of thinking, but realizing there are some, you know, things that look quite similar that actually are still very good for people, but they're, they're not eating. Yeah. Um, your dietary perspective and, and recommendations, although very plant focused and kind of plant centric are not ideologically sort of driven and, and they're not um, super strict in that regard. They're more like, this is what looks like the science supports and this is what I'm you know, advising you to do and not do. And an added wrinkle on top of that, that I found really interesting in the book is addressing not only um, how the food is prepared, like have you cooked it? Is it better to eat raw? Or this is stuff I've thought about often, like should I eat this vegetable raw or is it better cooked? Is it better to light? What happens if you overcook it? Am I destroying all the nutrients in it? Um, and then also, how is the food packaged? What is the impact of you know, food that's wrapped in plastic? And particularly if you end up like heating that food up while it's in the plastic and you kind of address all of these, which I think are you know, kind of common questions we all think about, but maybe don't pay enough attention about. So can you kind of unravel some of that? Uh, well, it's a lot to unravel. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, um, I, it I, is. I, I mean, I, you I, can read the book, but like maybe some sort of general principles around that. Yeah, well, I, I think a little bit comes down to understanding a bit more about the structure of food and um, cooking changes the structure of food. So yeah, there was a common misconception that raw food is better for you. And the raw food movement has you know, led a lot of this. And, but all the science suggests that actually lightly cooking food is the optimal uh, so lightly steaming your food breaks down the structures, allows the mm -hmm. nutrients to come out without destroying some of these um, vitamins and, and nutrients. And these polyphenols we talk about, these defense chemicals um, that are in all plants that are really rocket fuel for our gut microbes that are really what we should all be trying to get more of that definitely aren't in ultra processed foods. So understanding the structure of food and how you're cooking is really important understanding that you know, freezing stuff, even microwaving is fine. Um, before I researched the book, I was, oh, you know, I'd got rid of my microwave. Mm -hmm. I thought this is terrible, you know. It's a, um, but it, it turns out that actually uh, it doesn't destroy nutrients in any way. It's actually good and it's much better for the planet. Um, so in terms of the energy used, you know, if you uh, say a baked potato in a microwave, it's much more efficient for climate change to use from it an en energy expenditure energy perspective. Expenditure perspective. Yeah, it may not like, taste I as good. Still it may not taste with the as idea good. of like having a microwave, but go but, ahead. But well, I was like you, you know. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but in a way, having researched the book, I've said, well, if I care about the planet, I should use both of these tools, you know, and um, uh, not be so obsessed with uh, uh, my prior beliefs. So, structured food's important. How you cook it's important. What you cook it with. So, just Combining foods together will change their mm -hmm. um, uh, their nutrient value as well. So, a lot of these Mediterranean dishes would use olive oil and garlic and onions. You know, collectively they actually produce many more healthy chemicals together than they do when you have them alone. Chopping up your garlic uh, ten minutes before you use it actually uh, trebles the amount of um, these. Uh, really beneficial nutrients in the, in the garlic that otherwise would get broken down. So there's all these kind of funny, weird stuff about structure of food uh, is useful for people to know in everyday life about mm -hmm. how to cook things. Um, yeah, obviously cooking stuff close to plastics, and, and you've alluded to some of this, you know, the problem of microplastics is something we should be aware of. We don't really know 
enough about it, except there's lots, far too much plastic around. And so limiting the plastic that's close to our food um, is also important. Um, and I, I think the other thing I, I uh, realized is that no one had really written a book before that looks at all the different food groups and first takes health, um, then takes the ethics. So, you know, were animals, you know, injured in it? What's, what's, the, what's mm -hmm. the, the ethical basis of that? Or were a lot of, there's a lot of new stuff about child slave labor, for example, chocolate and, that, and uh, coffee and various other mm -hmm. uh, tropical things that we need to be aware of. Palm but also oil. finally, the, the big other area is the environment. Sure. And it was a bit of an eye opener for me because it's quite hard often to balance these three things when you're making, you're going into a store and you want to buy something nice and you're trying to work out all of, the, you know, to get all three perfectly aligned at the same time is kind of tough. And so, and it, particularly when it comes to something like uh, artificial milks. So mm -hmm. I found that really interesting because I'd experimented with cutting out dairy milk. And the main reason for me to cut out uh, dairy is because of its harmful effect on the planet when you calculate how many cows and methane and land, land use, et cetera. So it makes obvious sense to cut that out. So I switched to oat milk, which you know, I didn't mind the taste of, it seemed quite good. But then I put a CGM on me while I was drinking oat milk and I saw it shoot up. So suddenly I've swapped what was this reasonably healthy um, fat, mild sugar mixture for a, a, a much higher sugar, much more refined product uh, meant that if I was having regular uh, oat milk, it would, for me, it would be bad. Other people might be fine, but it would, that would be, be better for the planet if we all switched to oat mm -hmm. milk. But it would probably cause more, um, d have some disease consequences as well. So there are lots of examples of how tough it is to balance some of these things. And, you know, are you going to get them from Mexico every, every week? Are you going to... How do you freeze them enough and, and where do you get the nuts from? So it starts to ask a lot of questions. Not, we don't have all the answers, but I think it, it made me think, and I want people to read the book, to, to think about food in a very different way because the food choices we make every day are the most important choices we make for our health and probably also for the planet. Yeah, 100%. I mean, every every purchase of food that you make is a vote for the world, you know, that, that, you know, will be, right? So it would be great if there was some kind of metric or carbon score or some numerical value that we could attribute to each food, you know, sort of product, food product that we buy that would kind of tally, like, what is the carbon footprint of this? You know, what went into the, the manufacturing and distribution of this? You know, what was the, the um, amount of like water and acreage and, you know, all of that. Well, we, and, you know, were we animals killed in this or like, oh. you know, so it, it's, it's impossible mm. to put all that on the consumer and expect them to like really be able to make an informed decision, especially when the larger food companies are doing their best to obscure any kind of transparency around that. Well, there are academics who have produced scores and we're working with them at Zoe and we do have a, a sort of beta score for all the common foods mm. that gives you an environmental index. And obviously the Zoe program is designed so that you, you, know, you get your a, a general, Zoe score, and I've got my scores in the book for various things, which is a combination of the three. But so we're we're thinking uh, sometime in the near future of adding in that fourth score, which would be the environmental impact score, so mm. that people who wanted to uh, prioritize environment above health uh, or have it as a major factor could actually have that. But it is so complicated; it would need it does need algorithms and, and an app. You can't retain all of this stuff in your head, knowing yeah. if that avocado comes from Mexico or it came from California, you know, what's the difference or, you know. And also is labeling is not reliable. It could, you know, all the, all the, the obscurant language around labeling, you think you're buying something that was grown in a certain way oh, yeah. and, you know, it most likely wasn't. And that opens up a conversation around, you know, a different, um, 
you know, a different component of of the microbiome, which is the sensitivity of our of our, you know, larger microbiome, not just to the foods that we're eating, but to environmental toxins, the air that we breathe, the personal care products that we use, skin cream, shampoos, et cetera. And not for nothing, the pesticides that find their way onto the foods that that we're eating that we're not even aware we're consuming, whether we're washing them or not. Um, and there's a spectrum of, of harm associated with that. But you know, how do you think about that? And have there been studies done to give us a real grounded scientific sense of the harm or lack of harm? Like what is the level of concern that we should have around that? Well, in researching the book, I mean, obviously looked at things like glyphosate and herbicides in particular, because I was wanting to look at exposures that nearly everyone has had. And the problem with this kind of study, it's pretty hard to find people who haven't been exposed mm -hmm. because whether you live in a rural area and there's lots of spraying around you or you eat a lot of vegetables or you eat breakfast cereal. We all you're have be, glyphosate coursing through our veins. All of us have yeah. glyphosate. And yes, the studies have shown that if you have organic food, uh, it has a fifth of the glyphosate levels of non-organic food, but you're still getting some. So everyone's exposed to some level. Because it's just blowing around in the wind from the neighboring farm and finds its way into the soil of the, or, of the organic farm. And obviously, as I start to eat more plants, I get a bit more nervous about this because <laughs> you don't get glyphosate on beef, for example, or, you know, um, or meat. Or you get a whole bunch of other, other stuff, stuff though. But, but, you know, so it's, but you're obviously compensated by you're eating lots of plants and vegetables, think you're doing the right thing. But if it's not organic, you are actually ingesting more glyphosate. And uh, I, I certainly realize there are also certain types of plant where you get more, many more. So if you like oats, and I know Americans love their oatmeal uh, in the morning, think it's a healthy food. Um, it has hu really high levels of glyphosate when the people have tested breakfast cereals because oats and rye, to dry them out, they, they'd spray it out as a way of harvesting it quicker. So used for different purposes. So I have a real problem with something that we're ingesting every single day of our lives, what effect that has on our bodies. Now, the science isn't, the epidemiology isn't conclusive. There's a suggestion that it inc in increases lymphomas and there are some, there've been some court cases on that. Um, it, they've done some mouse studies that show that uh, it, it does affect the gut microbiome because these, these uh, chemicals were designed so they didn't affect human genes. So they don't, uh, not supposed to interact with human genes, but they're supposed to kill uh, plant genes and they, and as collateral damage, they take out uh, quite a few of our microbial uh, genes as well. So we are seeing disruption in the gut microbiome due to glyphosates and they, animal models have shown that they do produce abnormal chemicals. Now, that's really all we know at the moment. Um, so there's nothing definitive but is sufficient to worry about. And there have been epidemiology studies such as one in France where they compared a group of people having organic foods uh, regularly versus non-organic foods and found big differences in cancer and um, uh, mortality levels mm. over, over the next 10 years. So there's enough for me to worry about. Um, I'm also worried about microplastics. Um, I think we don't understand that and they, we do know that they do get into our gut and can cause disruption in our, in our gut microbes as well. And um, they're also enough if you eat a lot of fish, you know, because you think fish are healthy mm -hmm. and they go into that in the book. Um, you're gonna be eating. And if you go to a nice non-sentient fish like mussels uh, and say, okay, I can eat those. They're great, they're really healthy, nutritious, but they've got a lot of microplastic in them because they, yeah. they suck it out of the sea. So we're sort of, screwing up our planet slowly. So all these good things um, we're having a problem with. But uh, so, you know, I, I think the, there is pretty clear evidence that um, these pesticides, et cetera, and uh, are bad for newborn babies and, and pregnant women and increase, they've done some small scale studies. Evidence for the whole population isn't yet definite, but certainly if you can afford it, 
then um, definitely go go organic uh, is is my advice. It's it, and unfortunately in most countries it's still more expensive, mm. and uh, mm-hmm. that, that's a problem. But yeah. I, I do worry about that. But having said that, it's still better to eat vegetables <laughs> and. Uh, Wor- not worry about the pesticides, the not eat the vegetables and the, the fruits. Yeah, and you can go to the environmental working groups list of the dirty dozen. There's a spectrum of, of, of harm with respect to that. If you're budget conscious about what, what's the most important food group to be organic versus conventional. But it, yeah, but it be, for your breakfast cereal, in the, in the US is one of the biggest uh, sources. Well, you should just get rid of that. Of that. Like, exactly. Just cross so it off the list, I think right? we, can, we can agree. <laughs> have a health warning like a cigarette packet and then right. say, yeah, if you have this at your own risk, you can't sue us if you get cancer. Um, what is your thoughts? A big piece of, let me preface this by saying, um, I think, I think you know, the scientific consensus is pretty clear that if you want, that you want a healthy microbiome, that having a robust and healthy microbiome is so crucial to so many facets of health. And we're only, uh, and, and, that, and that the level of that um, relationship and importance is only growing as more science is coming out. And a key component to maintaining the robustness of that ecology is a diversity of plants in your diet. You talked about 30 plants a week. Um, eating a diet that's high in fiber, uh, that is high in prebiotics and fermented foods, which are probiotics, et cetera. Um, and with that, what is your response to this growing uh, enthusiasm around what's being called the carnivore diet, which is a diet that is, if not exclusively meat, is almost entirely meat-based. There's a lot of people, particularly on the internet who are espousing the benefits of that, saying how much better they feel, how it helped them resolve whatever kind of chronic ailment they had. Um, And this seems to be more than a fad at the moment. Like there's a lot of people who are um, very enthusiastically, uh, you know, sharing their anecdotal experience with this. Well, the the good side of it is generally these people are not having ultra processed foods. Agreed. Okay? So they are doing some good in that. Where, uh, and I, I also get people saying, I've been on a carnivore diet for two years, I feel great. You know, What are you talking about? You need all these plants. Um, we do know that people who don't eat plants, a variety of plants have less diverse gut microbes their microbial health is, is generally poor, which means they will uh, have a poorer immune system. And so my, my worry about the carnivore diet is that it, is, it may work short term, they might feel better and so, not everybody. I know some people who really can't tolerate those, those levels of uh, meat or fats. And we know this is, there's individual variations. So there are some people who can tolerate it and for, for a short while will feel better, might lose weight, might feel they're getting, you know, they're feeling stronger, et cetera. And that, that, I think that's genuine, but long-term they're gonna be causing harm to their system, their immune system, because they're not nourishing those gut microbes. They're, you know, the average American has, you know, only half the, the microbial species of say that had a hunter mm-hmm. our ancestors through antibiotics, through poor foods, through ultra processed foods, et cetera, et cetera. So they're gonna be denuding that even more. And so that means their armory of chemicals that they can use to fight infections, to help um, negotiate their energy balance, their metabolism, et cetera, is gonna be used up. So whenever they have a problem, they're gonna, they're gonna be in trouble. They just won't have the tools to be able to uh, deal with it and have an immune system that I think is gonna be wanting for most people. I'm not saying there are some rare individuals who might be able to get by for longer than others without this problem. In general, it's a problem. And I think the other misconception is this is what our ancestors ate. I mean, I spent a week with the Hadza tribe um, about uh, five or six years ago and saw at first hand what these hunter gatherers in Tanzania, Mm -hmm. what they actually eat and you know, I ate exactly as they did, and 
you know, I was filled up at about 10 o'clock with baobab porridge, which is um, this, it just falls off the trees and you mash it up with a bit of water and that's your that huge high fiber mass. You can't stop farting after that. You know, you're just so full of fiber. You're eating berries. And then at, at lunchtime, you'd have, the, the women would dig up tubers, um, which are like, you know, uh, old, uh, ancient yams, like a sort of form of sweet potato, and that would be um, lunch. And then the guys would go out and do a bit of hunting, and on top of that, they would bring back some meat if they if they found any. But for large periods of the year, they'd be having no meat, uh, and the, most of their calories would come from the carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. And if there was honey around, they they didn't want meat. They just uh, they just went for the honey. They just uh, they stopped hunting completely. They uh, you know just satiated themselves on the honey. So it's, people have a very different uh, perception of what our ancestors were actually doing, and the majority of what their their food w- it, w- it was was plant based uh, and carbohydrate based. It wasn't a high protein, high fat diet. And they have the healthiest gut microbes. They don't get chronic diseases. They never get cancer. All, all these things that we've now developed as part of the West. So, mm-hmm. so the Hatta is for people that don't know uh, an African traditional hunter gatherer tribe that has been able, for the most part, to maintain their lifestyle and their traditions amidst a rapidly kind of encroaching, developing world, and they have the most robust microbiomes because they have a very robust environment and extremely diverse uh, uh, amount of plant life on which they, you know, pers- they, they sort of persist and exist, right? Um, but it's, 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 it feels like there's a, there's a deadline on that. Uh, when, I don't know, when were you there? Like, it, 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 like it's the world is encroaching on them, right? And some of their traditions are beginning to erode and their dietary habits are, are starting to kind of shift as a result of that. Yeah. Which is awful. The area they're yeah. in is getting squashed by yeah. people cutting down trees around mm-hmm. them and pastoralists moving in. And of course, you know, they've got all these researchers around them now. Uh, right, everybody yeah. wants to study. I have a guy coming in tomorrow who went down and lived with them also. Yes, uh, so, for different uh, reasons, but yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, hopefully they will survive a bit longer, but it, they're sort of running out of room, mm-hmm. and uh, they are the last true hunter-gatherer tribe, really in um, in Africa. And uh, it, but I think it's really important we do learn the lessons from them. And we've learned so much about sleep and exercise and calorie burning and all these amazing things that have gone counterintuitive to what we, we believed. We thought, you know, um, the fact they don't burn uh, many more calories than you know, we do and, you know, um, and they're not, you know, they're not running all the time either, you know? No, they, they, and they're happier and they're more connected to their community and their neighbors and their family members. <laughs> and I think for the most part, anybody I know that's had any contact with them said, you know, basically they're, they're, Happy they're, go lucky they're doing guys. it a lot better than we are. Exactly. And there's, you, don't, you don't see obesity, you don't see diabetes, mm-hmm. you know, and they die when they fall out of trees or they get um, hit by animals. So, you know, it's not, they don't live to a ripe old age, but, um, they don't really have a concept of age. And uh, it was just interesting and, you know, it was fascinating to see them, you know, I asked them, when do you have breakfast? And they didn't have a word for breakfast. So uh, this is again, you know, an invention of perhaps Kellogg's that mm. we all have to have breakfast and uh, otherwise, you know, we're, we're not um, eating healthily. And so, it, you know, it is this last chance to see how uh, we did evolve. For, and they, I think they've been there for, you know, at least 15,000 years or in, in that similar sort of environment, which is, you know, where we are supposed to evolve from, you know, around mm-hmm. the equator. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, it's, it's a pity, but um, yeah, we've learned a lot from them. And I, I certainly did, my microbes actually. Um, uh, oh, you tested before and after, right? Uh, yeah, that, so, uh, and I, I was eating everything they had. So the baobab, the yam, but you know, we, one day we, you know, it was porcupine was on the menu. So, you know, oh um, which is not something you get regularly and um, various other animals that I had no idea what they were, but they, they all got thrown on the barbecue. But 
we were surrounded by animals and dirt and um, they're the microbes as well. So I think part of this is also the environment that we've lost. Mm -hmm. As we moved into cities, everything's sterile. You know, we're not, we need to go back to hugging trees and um, uh, getting back to nature. And that's why gardeners have better microbes than non-gardeners. You know, I think we also realize it external as well as what we eat as well is important. But um, yeah, my microbes um, improved by about 30% in diversity while I was there. But when I got back on you know, airplane food on the way back, by, you know, by the time I got back to London, it, it had gone straight back to, to where Did you it was. keep that culture though and store it for future uh, proliferation? I, yeah, I, I wouldn't have got through the security. <laughs> I think oh, <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I mean that that conjures up the next thing, which is 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 the future of fecal transplants. Like it does seem like there's something interesting there. Like if you can, when, the more we learn about the microbiome, and the more we figure out how to kind of cultivate a very bespoke ecology for a particular individual. Um, the idea of these fecal transplants seems to be a really good idea. I think it's a great idea and, but I would say that the hope and hype we had 10 years ago hasn't played out as much as I would have hoped. Mm -hmm. Um, It is the number one treatment for a couple of conditions, mainly really bad infections and uh, something called recurrent C. diff, Clostridium difficile, you get recurrent diarrhea 30 times a day, usually caused by antibiotics overuse. That is 90% of the time cured by a single, you know, a single uh, transfusion of a healthy donor uh, stool sample. But there are not many uh, other conditions where it's shown to be nearly as effective. Mm. And the early hope that it would be a, a a cure for obesity has been shown to be false. So you can't take someone's skinny, skinny feces and put them into uh, uh, an obese person and make them skinny. It doesn't work. Um, but isn't there, there's some indicia around cravings though, aren't, isn't there with this or no? There are- Or autoimmune diseases. Well, it, it does work in a proportion of people with ulcerative colitis, which is an autoimmune disease. Mm-hmm. So that's the other, hope because there's at least one disease where um, I think it's about one in four or one in five people have remission. So they, it's like there's, you know, there's no sign of the disease after it, which is pretty much as good as the drugs, the, the medicines, the immunotherapies that they're given, which is, is pretty good. But it doesn't work for other related conditions. Um, other autoimmune conditions doesn't seem to work nearly as well. So we don't really understand what it is. And it, it could be that you know, the microbiome of the host, the person who's, you know, the sick person has to be so bad, there's actually nothing there mm-hmm. in order for the new microbes to colonize and take over. And if it's too stable, it's really hard to mm. gain a hold. Plus the fact we haven't matched up the donor and the recipient very well. And we don't know what the magic factors are. Mm-hmm. So I think there's still time to do it, but I think uh, it's not looking as hopeful as it was. Um, perhaps 10 years ago to be, you know, the cure all for everything. But the exceptions to this are in cancer, where they've done a a couple of cases of people who survived metastatic melanoma, responded very well to immunotherapy, and they took their their stool sample and they gave that to people who'd failed immunotherapy and were about to die. Mm. And a, a reasonable proportion of them were rescued Wow. So um, there could be very specific cases for people who have very bad microbes where um, they just need that extra shot to, to, to improve them. Mm-hmm. So I think we're still finding our way and um, trying to get around this idea that because we're so different, it's very hard to come up with a sort of one size fits all solution and they don't quite know whether to get 10 donors and put them all in a, you know, a magi mix and, uh, and and serve up that soup, or they should be specifically looking for certain microbes, or you should be artificially producing these um, 
faecal transplants. And there are trials going, many right. trials going on artificially to look at it. But so I think cancer is the one area of the most hope and excitement. And going back to the idea, I think it, in the not too distant future, everyone's going to be storing their stool sample, maybe to use when they have cancer treatment, mm -hmm. um, give themselves the best chance. And, you know, storing up the, the people who've successfully fought off cancer against the odds and worked out what it is about those, those uh, microbes that are so good at helping that person's yeah, immune yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's, yeah, it, it's um, a nuanced game, as we say, but I think we were misled because a lot of people thought it was a cure for obesity. Right. That um, a lot of people um, were doing this on the internet, oh, and well. uh, you know, sort of, uh, <laughs> and, and had some very really bad results. Uh -huh. um, another uh, source of confusion uh, surrounds uh, the importance or lack thereof of of fermented foods. We talked about the thirty plants a week thing. Um, I think there's a lot of people who think as long as I'm getting some fermented foods in my diet on some kind of regular basis. I don't have to worry as much about the 30 plants a week or the diversity of, of the foods that I'm eating. How important is the fermented food piece? And then on top of that, how do we know that the kind of cultures, the fermented cultures that are in these foods are actually efficacious? We were talking about kombucha before the podcast or in these yogurts or these kefirs it'll say, you know, it has this and that in it, but you know, what is the pasteurization process? Like do these cultures, you know, persist through the manufacturing and distribution process of these foods such that they have any kind of viability once, you know, they're consumed? So lots of questions there. The, um, I think the first, first one is I think to build a healthy gut microbiome, you've got to get the diversity of plants in there as your number That's one. That's number one. If you don't eat plants, I don't, any amount of fermented food is gonna really help you because the uh, probiotic microbes in the fermented food don't actually stay in your gut very long. They pass through. And they, as they're passing through, they stimulate um, the other microbes to produce helpful chemicals. We don't exactly understand that because, but we know that the microbes, for example, in kefir or yogurt, or these lactobacilli, they're designed to live in yogurt, milk and, and yogurt, not in your mm. intestine mm -hmm. long-term. So they pass through and they have to have an, a sort of collateral effect on that environment. They just, for reasons we don't still understand, they, they make them produce better chemicals. We discussed these pharmacy idea. They're sort of boosting the pharmacy to produce those chemicals for you is the, is the current idea of what, what they do. And obviously the, the greater the diversity of the microbes that are doing that, the better your chance of it working. That's why kefir has more microbes than yogurt, uh, perhaps 10 times more different species. It's a more complex um, uh, fermented food. Uh, and cheese you know, often has only two or three uh, microbial species, unless you get some exotic French ones, which are often illegal in the, in the US because they're, they're, they're too dangerous. Um, and then you've got uh, things like kimchi, uh, where the fermented food is, you've got the microbes which are eating the, the cabbage and the garlic and the, and the, mm -hmm. and the chilies. And there may be maybe 30 different microbes in there, including yeast and fungi. And the difference with those foods is that they're also prebiotic because you're also eating the, the plants that are nourishing the microbes. So they will probably hang around a bit longer than say just your mm -hmm. kefir or your yogurt or your cheese ones. Um, so, and the kombuchas are similarly complex, often uh, between 10 and 30 different microbe species. Um, but um, how do you tell that? So you want to steady, so little and often is the rule. So there's no point in having a big once a, a week feast. You want to have a small little shots. And I think studies suggesting that if you can get three small portions a day, that's probably pretty ideal of, of different types of these fermented foods. And how do you tell uh, what the best products are? It's really difficult. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we were discussing kombuchas and, you know, I was in a, a store uh, with Will. We were, we were looking at some of these range, great range of kombuchas in California, but some of them just at the bottom just say, oh, gently pasteurized. Right. So it's dead. So probably if it's a little use, although there is some evidence there are some microbes that do work when they're pasteurized, but I don't think these ones mm -hmm. have been proven to work. And so checking whether it's been pasteurized, checking its um, the date, how long its shelf life is. If it's, if it's live, it's not gonna have a really long shelf life. And so you, you pick up a kombucha, you wanna see whether there's any sediment in the bottom. Is there something like a mini blob in there that's, that could form? And, like, and s similarly, um, other products, if you're taking kimchi or sauerkraut, make sure it's not in vinegar. It's actually live and it says live microbes on it. Hasn't, again, make sure it hasn't been pasteurized even gently. And th the ultimate test is probably to try some of these, either get a brand you really know and can trust. And, and if you don't know them, test them. You, know, you, can, you can take the sediment of a kombucha and if you put that into a bit of tea and sugar, and leave it for a week, mm -hmm. uh, you'll know whether it's real or not. <laughs> Similarly, yeah. if you take the end of a kefir, um, if it's live, it should, if you pour it into a glass of milk, within 24 hours, that should have turned into kefir. So there are ways of, of, of actually doing your own little practical experiments to, to work this out, but it's, it's a real, um, uh, problem for the consumer mm -hmm. at the moment. There isn't right. Like the consumer to shouldn't you. have to do that, no. you know, to figure this out. Like we we shouldn't have to run our own experiments to validate whatever's on a label or and, isn't. And beware of artificial sweeteners as well in in a lot of these products, because we know they're harmful for the gut microbes as well. So you're doing some mm -hmm. good and some bad. You might you know have to bit off, put up with a little bit of sugar, not too sweet, uh, rather than having artificial chemicals, which uh, will have a negative effect on the, on the gut mm. microbes. And what about a proper probiotic, not as a replacement for a healthy, robust, diverse diet, but as something as sort of a cherry on top. Um, in the book, there, there's a study that you talk about with respect to um, uh, COVID and kind of outcomes around, uh, you know, populations that were on a probiotic versus not on a probiotic. So. Where's your thinking around that? Because there's also a lot of confusion and there's a wide spectrum of products out there. Um, and I think a lot of consumers struggle to kind of make sense of that world. Yeah, well, to cover the COVID stuff first, we did a, again, a survey of about a million people and looked at their COVID outcomes and whether we're taking vitamin supplements or probiotics. And virtually none of the vitamin supplements had a consistent effect uh, on preventing right, the COVID. omega three, the D. What else did you look at? Like, because there was a whole vitamin, lot about like if you're on D, C, um, you're going to be in good shape. Vitamin C, mm -hmm. garlic tablets, um, um, multivitamins. But the one that looked like it had the biggest effect was actually regular use of probiotics. This was an observational study, so it's full of potential biases and flaws. But you know, it for someone. In gut health, and I'm biased to say, well, that mm -hmm. that, that look, looked like a good result for me. Um, right, I'll put that one in the but, book. But um, we did a few years ago. We did a meta-analysis for the British Medical Journal and looked at all the evidence for probiotics. Um, and there's absolutely no evidence that if you're healthy, probiotics prevent you getting disease. Okay, so for mm -hmm. the healthy person to take them regularly, probiotic capsules or or however you take them. Uh, no clear evidence for, for healthy normal people, they are useful. There's some evidence that in um, chil neonates, early young children and el the elderly, they can be beneficial. So there's some randomized trials that show they are, some are good in preventing infections or, or other problems. They also are, have shown to work in, uh, if you have, for example, some GI infections, in balance, they do, they do work. There's some evidence they work in uh, mild depression in randomized control trials. So mm. there are a few examples where, and this, this irritable bowel syndrome is another common, there's some evidence they work a bit in, the, in these conditions. Now, many people, they don't work at all. It's, it's not totally consistent. 
And a lot of this is probably because each, each probiotic is different. They're protected by patents, so um, they can't be used by other companies. And our individual microbes are very different as well. So it's not surprising there's this big difference. So although we can say that many of these conditions, probiotics work, I can't say which one you should take because mm -hmm. the studies have included lots of different ones. So it's, but I think we're in a stage now where we're moving to the second, second stage of probiotics. There's some exciting ones that have come out of this new science because all these ones are very old we're talking about, all the ones you see out there. But um, there are some new microbes like Akkermansia, um, for example, uh, is a bug that has been shown to reduce uh, blood glucose levels in trials and actually works just as well dead as it does alive. Hmm. And it, it's, it's a very common feature in, in the new in uh, all the new microbiology we're seeing. So I think the next generation are going to be much better and much more designed for human health than these old ones, which have just been around uh, on some company's shelf uh, with a patent for a, for a long time. Yeah. So, so it's, it, I, I, I'm not giving you a very clear answer, but I think it's, um, I still think you're much better off taking your probiotics as food than as supplements. Cause, yeah, of course. Because you're getting a bigger mix. Yeah, of course, of course. And I appreciate the 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 you know kind of respect for the complexity and, and nuance of all of this. Like you know, our human brains want that clear cut answer. Do we this, don't fix. do that. Yeah, give me the tablet. And uh, you're like, ah, not so fast. You know, even with each one, like everything in this book, like you know, there is that layer of complexity that I think when you read it, you begin to understand like why it's so hard to even tackle this subject to begin with. Like you, how many years did you spend writing this book? Six like, years. yeah, so. I realized why no one else you know, had done it. And it's, a, it's almost in, in this day and age, a courageous act to like dip your toe into the world of nutrition and, and make a statement, you know, because, you know, it is, it is, it is so difficult to provide kind of any actionable, you know, guidelines around it because the, the science is, you know, is, in many ways, so inconclusive, and there's so many variables that come into play, like you know, in terms of and and the personalization, you know, aspect of it that is emerging, that makes it even harder to say you should do this and not do this, right? Um, but we do have to end this podcast, so maybe we could do that with if there are any kind of concrete, you know, rules or or recommendations for the person who's, you know, brand new to the idea of the microbiome even being a thing and who's grappling with the idea of making, you know, healthier choices for themselves, um, you know, beyond the 30 kind of plants a week, uh, what are some other principles uh, that you could share? Because at the end of, you know, the chapters, you do kind of like bullet point, like here's some, here's some kind of clear takeaways that I think would be helpful. So top of mind, you know, what sits atop the kind of most important of those? Well, we've covered some of them. So obviously eating the rainbow is, you know, the colors are there for a reason and they're actually really good. So, you know, don't eat beige. Yeah, um, don't eat beige. Yeah, go colorful. Um, that's, go, the, that's the title of this podcast. Go I bitter, many out, bitter yeah. things are actually good. Um, you know, one reason coffee's so healthy for you is it's got full of polyphenols and, you know, I recommend coffee over orange juice anytime as a health drink. It should be in the health section. Uh, dark chocolate's another surprising one. Cook, cook with extra virgin olive oil rather than any other oil. Don't believe all this nonsense about... Um, Heat, heating points. Yes. Yeah, the, you go into stuff that as well. Rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, the... Um, uh, the way you eat is also important. So um, we, you know, we've we've talked um, about what to eat, but uh, time restriction eating we've discussed. We didn't discuss that actually has a really big benefit on your gut microbes. So all the studies show that if you leave a big gap um, overnight, so your your gut is rested just as the hunter-gatherer tribes did, you know, they're, they're not nibbling uh, snack bars or protein bars at night. They're, mm -hmm. you know, they're resting just as they're sleeping, giving that full circadian rhythm, real chance to real synchronize. So I think that's, that's an important part. So there's reducing the snacking 
time, less meals, giving yourself, you know, at least 12 hours overnight, ideally 14, is a good way for your gut to, to repair itself and enhance. Um, eating more slowly, um, we all eat too fast. I think one in five American meals are consumed in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, it's difficult to have a leisurely meal in the car. Um, just, you know, wait. Do you like the Mediterranean countries? You know, just don't have snacks. Wait and have a proper meal. You know, make it a social good occasion. Enjoy the food. Um, and, uh, you know, learn to try something new every uh Every week you should be aiming for something, something new as extra. So part of this 30 plants is to discover new things you haven't eaten and you know, get your taste buds to try something, something new all the time and introduce that to your family and make, make food something exciting rather than a chore because we all mm -hmm. get into these ruts in our choices. We find something we like and we think it's healthy. We have the same thing. Well, that, you know, our microbes don't like that. We, you know, they like to be tested all the time. So I think it's all about an adventure, experimenting, find out whether you're someone who does well, you know, with this long overnight fast and not snacking or whether you are someone who does need to eat. There are different people. Are you an early morning person, a late morning person? Try skipping breakfast. Try changing your breakfast for, you know, from a high carb one to a high fat one. See how you feel. Try and just think about how your body's working don't accept that everything's the same for everybody. And I think the more we can all experiment and understand our bodies, the better we get to understand food and, and live with it. And, and always think about your food now, again, in these food choices. If you care about the planet, really think about the, those, those food choices you're making because as an individual, it is the number one thing we can all do uh, to save our planet. Beautifully put. I really appreciate it. Um, final thing before I let you go uh, would be around um, the kind of science that you would like to see being performed right now. Like what is the study that hasn't been done yet that you feel is most important to be conducted? And, and you know, what is kind of on the nearer horizon for Zoe and the research um, that's going on there that has you excited? Well, in general, the study that will never be done would be a massive randomized control trial of ultra processed food against uh, real food and uh, pay people to do this. Uh, you know, Why can't we do that? Because- uh, Who's gonna fund it? Who's gonna fund it and- uh, We already know the answer though. Irrationally, the ethics board would probably say it's unethical <laughs> to randomize one arm to the American diet and the other arm to a healthy diet. Um, but that's, that's what we need to, you know, shake this up. So far, the study has been limited to a few weeks. And, uh, you know, we, that's, that's where I think I, I would, you know, if you, all the money in nutrition do, do that study, that would um, change our system and mm -hmm. show, show how bad it is for us. Um, the Zoe studies are, it's evolving all the time and introducing all kinds of new features and giving people personalized feedbacks on whether they're dippers or not. Um, you know, should they be worried about giving, we're trying to move towards giving people real time advice about um, what they should be eating. Uh, we are just starting retesting. So this is a really exciting time. People can see if they've, um, reduce their sugar peaks and their fat peaks and then improve their gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. What does it look like on retest and how their gut microbes are tested and the results are looking really good on that. Mm. And Because no one's managed to do that yet so far. And, and so using the gut microbiome is a pretty good sort of, like your dental checkup that you go to every six months or so to say, how am I doing when I'm experimenting? It's quite hard to know. Um, I think we're gonna start doing these citizen science projects within within the Zoe product so that we'd love several thousand people to start, you know, go on fermented foods for a month and see what the difference is. Others, um, got intermittent fasting, um, all these lifestyle interventions I think would be really exciting and we you know, want people to join in this big community. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, there's so much stuff going on as well as feeding back these new insights into the microbiome. 
maybe getting some of those microbes into as new probiotics and prebiotics mm -hmm. because they've never been discovered before, but they have really big effects in our, in our data now. We see these, these huge effects of these microbes that don't have names yet. And right. so um, if we can harness them, you know, they, they could be super powerful medicines as well. So yeah, there's, there's sort of too much to, uh, I'm, you know, a kid in a sand pit that's, that's full of toys and um, it's, it's a fantastic time to be doing science. Yeah, yeah, well, I can tell it lights you up and uh, it's a really fascinating uh, new kind of emerging field. Like if I was a young medical student, this would be where I would wanna you know, be focusing on right now because you're at the very beginning of something that clearly is only gonna grow and, and, and become kind of more integral to all aspects of, 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 of human health and planetary health too. So it's really exciting. And I think the work you're doing is really important. It's inspiring. And uh, it was great to talk to you today. So thank you. Appreciate it. It's been fun. Yeah, it was good. Um, if you wanna learn more, uh, pick up Tim's book, Food for Life, The New Science of Eating Well. You can check out the Zoe app. Join Zoe.com. Yeah, join Zoe, Zoe.com. And uh, any other places you wanna direct viewers and listeners? Uh, follow me on Instagram. Uh, if you, people still do that. Um, <laughs> they still do. I think uh, they still do. You're not on TikTok? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't admit to it. <laughs> ah, there we go. No, no, I'm, I'm not on TikTok. I can't. Uh -huh. I haven't got the, the patience right. or technology for that. Yeah. How's but, Will? How's Doctor B doing? Is he doing a good job? Should we give him an, a, 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 a review right now while he's sitting right here? Yeah. No. He's, you gonna he, fire him? No. He's, he's <laughs> nine out of ten. Nine out of good. ten. He just. Uh, all right. Needs to bring more sunshine to the venues when he listens. Yeah, good man. Thank you. Well, uh, come back again and uh, share with me more about what's happening. Look I'm sure it's changing all the time, right? Oh yes. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks. Peace. Plants.